Hey folks, welcome back to Ken Michaels Radio, where we talk all the time about the Beatles and bring on special guests. And certainly we have a very, very special guest on the program this time. His name is Colin Hall. He is Liverpool born, and we're going to be talking about several aspects of his life here. But most importantly, um, he just released this book, which is called The Songs the Beatles Gave Away. And this book covers the songs that the Beatles gave to other artists in the 60s while they were still together. It's an extremely thorough book. And I highly recommend it because you not only learn about the songs they gave away, but history connected to all these artists, what what they were doing before um, they recorded a Lennon McCartney song. Most of these songs are Lennon McCartney songs. And then what followed after if Colin... Um, could find out the information about it. But um, this all stems from a BBC Two documentary that he worked on. And um, this was with the legendary broadcaster, Bob Harris. And this was back in 2006, I believe. Um, the songs the Beatles gave away. Anyway, Colin Hall, welcome to Ken Michaels Radio. Well, it's a great pleasure to be uh, on your radio uh, show, Ken. And um, uh, an honor. I feel very honored because you know, your the reputation of your show goes before you. Oh, thank you so thank much. You. Um, you know, I, I've been telling Colin we've got to do more than one show because yes. he was the custodian at Mendips for many, many years. And his wife, Sylvia, <laughs> was the custodian at 24th Lynn Road, where Paul lived. Yeah. So you've got all this history and Colin and Sylvia probably have a lifetime's worth of memories just from doing that work alone. Telling I, I people, think, yeah. I, I think we have. I mean, I still am. I'm just about uh, March. The house is re reopened and I'm still in, um, in I situ, situ, you know, I'm still the custodian at Mendix. Okay. For, for, for I think it will be the 20th year. Sylvia has retired now. Okay. Um, she's busy looking after our grandson. So uh, that's a full time job. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but I'm, yeah, I'm going back in just a week, a uh, week tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But how Maybe remarkable tomorrow. is that? A husband and wife team mm -hmm. doing the same kind of work for two of mm -hmm. the most important, lo important locations, homes that the Beatles lived in. Yeah, I, I, it, it is. It is, you know, sometimes. We used to have to pinch ourselves that we were doing that. You know, it was quite quite exceptional, and um, but it was fun. You know, it, it um, whatever whatever mood you were in. I always say this: whatever mood you were in in the morning, and let's face it, you know, you don't always wake up in the best of moods, or you 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 know, uh, you, but you go down to your job, and um, you open the door, and there's uh, fifteen people um, who are just bursting to get in that house and yeah. uh, to to walk into the homes where John and Paul grew up and where together they would be writing songs like uh, I saw her standing there and um, and it's magical because you uh, the energy that people bring into those properties is quite something mm. uh, and um, it's irresistible so you know it was it was well, you you might have been going to work thinking, oh no, we just got the tax bill. <laughs> but then by the end of the day, you're walking on air, you know. And then so it, it, it's a, it's a very special thing to do, and, yeah. and a, a privilege, really. You know, um, yeah, you get paid for it, but by golly, <laughs> it was a privilege. It is an honor. That's got to be a dream job for both you <laughs> and and your wife. And, yeah. Uh, it, we got to well, be grateful. We, we got to be grateful too that um, the National Trust, you know, put up uh, Mendes. So was Yoko's. Yoko donated that, right? Mendes. She did. She bought it in two thousand. Um, she bought it in two thousand and two, I think it was, and then she donated it immediately to the trust. It opened in two thousand and three to the public, and uh, they the trust had uh, such a fabulous organization. They had. Uh, restored it to how it was in the in the 50s when John was beginning his musical journey but she always said look this is 
this is not about the Beatles, this house. This is about John. This is, um, he, he spent nearly half his life living in this home. Mm. It was his home. This is not, this is not the Beatles. This is John's home. Right. And so that's what she wanted it to be, not just another museum to the Beatles. She said, the Beatles didn't live here. This is where my husband lived. Right. Yeah. And so it's about his formative years. But of course, some of those years, um, he, he spent as a quarryman <laughs> more than a Beatle, really. And um, so it, it is about that. And it's the same with Paul's house. And of course, Paul's house wasn't just Paul's house. It was Michael's, his brother's house. Mm. <laughs> um, and of course, his mum and dad. And uh, so the story is also about Paul and Michael McCartney and, and their youth, youthful years in, in, in that house. So it's a wonderful story and it, it encompasses so much of, of the story of uh, post-war Liverpool as well. And an awful lot was going on in Liverpool as well. Sure. And I wasn't aware until we were talking right before we started to record this that you live on Menlove Avenue. <laughs> I, yeah, I live. Um, I, if, if, if I was a younger man and a bit of a hooligan, I could throw a stone and it would land in John's garden, you know. <laughs> oh, you're that I don't close. Throw, I don't throw stones. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I am, you know. I, we, I walk to work and uh, it's literally a case of tumbling out of bed you know walking just well within two minutes if I'm dragging my heels I'm at work I'm that close and I look from my window where I'm sitting right now I look out um, onto uh, the golf course over which there are footpaths that John and Paul used to take to each other's houses when they were young teenage boys and where Paul um, said one night when he was walking over uh, that footpath and feeling a bit spooked, when it's dropping dark. So he starts thrashing his guitar and um, came up with um, some chords and, and a, a bit of a tune that he, he fashioned into um, uh, a world without love that wow. he later gifted all the stories in this new book of mine. Uh, he later gifted to um, Peter Asher and Gordon Wallop, Peter and Gordon, World Without sure. Love, Worldwide. Number one hit that he wrote when he was 16, one night walking from Mendips to his own house. And um, and John was never so keen on this song. He, he didn't like the words, please lock me away, you know. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> so Paul didn't get, you know, didn't forget it, kept it up here. Yeah. And... Um, and when the time was right, when he moved into Wimpole Street and was living with Jane uh, and Peter and the, and the family, and Peter said, well, I've got a duo, formed a duo with Gordon, school friend. Um, Paul said, oh, I've got a song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Finished. well, I, I, you should know, by the way, I, I've interviewed Peter. I, I interviewed mm -hmm. Peter with Gordon. Oh, as right. well right. Okay. and yeah. um and billy j kramer has been a long time friend of mine i've known him since the 80s but um with a world without love everything was written except the middle eight the yeah. so i wait and in a while so um yeah peter asked if he could finish it up and paul wrote it real quickly that that yeah. uh, middle eight part and then the song was completely it was born it was finished mm -hmm. and given to them and um you know kicked off their careers <laughs> no big time big yeah. time was, i mean and the, the great thing about um world without love is that uh, obviously you know as kids we were listening to that and um it it took you know the popular music in a different direction it's got a folky acoustic feel to it because it's mm. played on those 12 strings and um and um in america on the west coast you know you've got a couple of guys listening there and they're thinking well oh, this is this is interesting and they're going to form the birds and that that kind of folk rock uh takes off on the west coast that um, and so uh, responsible in a way really for a whole new adventure in music uh, mm. that emanates from from the west coast um so you know there you go well Welcome. you know what they say about the Beatles is they took so much from America mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, they gave back to to America and then they were influenced yeah. by what they were doing. 
So yeah, it's yeah. the same thing with other artists. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it, and, you know, whatever John said, I, I still think it's a, a, a wonderful, wonderful song. You know? Oh, absolutely. All right. Um, why don't you just discuss how you came to be involved with Bob Harris in doing this documentary uh, radio show on this well, topic? Well, Bob and I have been friends for quite a while. We we met uh, backstage at the Cambridge Folk Festival, which is this wonderful folk festival um, in, in in Britain. Um, and we got talking, and um, he he discovered that I was the custodian at Mendip, so he came up uh, for a little look around and a bit of a tour of Liverpool because when folks come up to visit me in Liverpool, it, their visit usually extends from Mendips around the village of Walton where I live. And then beyond Walton, we, we take in the city itself. And, um, but when we were in Walton, which from where I live, you've got the, you've got the golf course. And then just uh, beyond my house is the uh, village of Walton itself and the church where the church fate was held. Mm -hmm. and where John meets Paul. And when we were standing in the uh, church uh, itself, standing in the um, in the graveyard, actually, uh, and I, I, I just pointed over the hedge and said, you know, that's the, where the school now is. That's the old church field. And it was in that very spot, because I'm very friendly with the quarryman and Col Hatton, mm -hmm. the, the drummer. So that's where Colin says the quarrymen were playing and where Paul first saw John. And at, and as I was saying it, I said to Bob, you know, um, it's 50 years since they met next mm -hmm. year. And Bob and I looked at each other and we said, well, we should celebrate that. So we did. We made a radio documentary called The Day John Met Paul, mm -hmm. and it was successful. It won um, a Sony um, uh, award. And we it bonded us as friends making that radio program. And he said to me, oh, we, this has been fun. Have you got any other ideas for a, for a, a program about, about the Beatles? And, and, and he said, it has to be something, though, that others haven't done. So I thought, mm, difficult, because everybody's done everything about the Beatles. And um, so I had to think, and I thought, well, you know what? The songs the Beatles gave away, the, they wrote songs in the 60s that they gifted. These weren't covers, but these were songs that they wrote for Billy Jay and Scylla. And um, those stories haven't been told. It's like a, a little annex to this, the Beatles songbook that, mm. that has kind of been forgotten in a way because the Beatles didn't record them and put them out under their own um, name, why don't we try and gather together those songs and interview the actual artist? So that became our next project and it became a Radio 2, a BBC Radio 2 documentary, which uh, I helped devise, I helped interview. I didn't appear in that one, but I, I was the kind of working behind the scenes with Bob to put it together. And that that's where it came from, because when we put the show together, it only lasted an hour. Um, we had all these interviews and I said to Bob, well, you know, we've interviewed George Martin. We've been um, and we've got these stories and only part of the interviews you. So I'd like to put that into a book. And he said, well, yeah, do it, because and, and there were some people we haven't got to. So I took that on board and. Um, And there it the is. Book. Here it is. That's what happened. Yeah. And you, you know what? Um, not to sound maudlin, but I'm so grateful that you did this because since then, a lot of many of these artists have passed away. So you have yes. you have their statements about recording this music. And yes. um, yeah, it's great to have this as a document now. Well, I think that because we we did talked to Sir George Martin. We spent a lovely day with him and his wife. And um, 
I mean, it was special anyway, but it, with events as they are, they became even more special. And um, we did speak to Scylla Black and I, I spent a lovely afternoon um, with uh, Jackie Lomax and Billy Hatton at the foremost used to pop into Mendips in my dinner hour hmm. and sit and we used to sit on the sofa and uh, it, it, Billy was such a, a fun person um, and so we became reasonable friends you know and he liked to drop in and we we laughed quite a lot <laughs> and um so that was that was special, and um, and so yes, the, these interviews became treasured, really by myself and by Bob, of course, mm. um, because they were like maybe the last time these folk visited that particular episode in their lives, and someone like Billy Hatton or, or Jackie Lomax were there in the days of the cavern right you know when none of them were signed jackie lomax was an undertaker you know not by profession but by the name <laughs> of his group um and so they'd been in that hurly burly world of the cavern and um they knew they knew what they were talking about they knew the beatles they knew those guys and um so they they, they had special insights really into into those and it, it, it you know so there, there was that I felt I was putting down a marker for them as, right. as someone you, you know who they and I could tell that they enjoyed sharing their stories with me it was it, and, and they recognized also how fortunate they were that John and Paul and George in in Jackie's case had said, here's a song, I've got a song for you. Right. And um, of course it, it opened up the charts for the foremost and it, it, it helped Jackie um, as well as a songwriter, you know, cause uh, he was a great songwriter in his own right. Yeah. I gotta tell you, I know exactly what you're going through when you do these, these audio interviews mm -hmm. and you put it into a radio show and you can only run a short excerpt. And you've got all this other stuff that you feel is really interesting. And what are you going to do with it? Did you yes. ever think about, because even in the book, you can't include everything that was said. No, I, that, I tried to. I tried to because I just thought, what else, when else can I, what, you know, I mean, it's it's my job to put in pretty much all of, all that I could. Right. There's very little left in the can if this is what you're asking. It, yes. It's, um, it's maybe me saying, would you like a cup of tea? <laughs> um, um, yeah, I I wish in some ways I'd filmed them, you know, mm. uh, because Billy in particular could pull some great faces. <laughs> you know, there's a photograph of us in the book standing outside Mendips, and we're pulling faces, and uh, yeah, you, you can see what a what a wit he was he was just good fun to be around i liked him a lot i'll bet okay um before we talk about specific songs that they gave to other artists one of the other things that i love about the book is that you go through the whole history of the early lennon mccartney songs before they had a record contract mm -hmm. um I always remember that early on when John and Paul were asked, how many songs have you written? I think John said something like 20 and then Paul blew it out of proportion. <laughs> something like, what was it, 200? And in, yes. fact, <laughs> in fact, the this recent event that I went to at Yale University where Paul just gave an interview for his lyrics book, he said that he and John wrote 300 songs. And right. uh, but But Paul also admitted that he exaggerated that many years ago. But you do talk about so many of these other early songs as well. I want to I want to discuss some of the things that were brought up in your book before we get to specific songs that they gave to other people, um, mm -hmm. and anything that has to do with their history that maybe I wasn't aware of. And I also realized that you seem mm -hmm. to use Mark Lewison's Tune In a lot as a resource, which is great. I love Mark, mm -hmm. you know, um, and especially the extended edition. Yeah, well, I think the extended edition. 
I cannot see anybody um, ever going there again. And he has had access to people that we're not going to have access to yeah. again, like uh, Neil Aspinall. And um, so if you ignore that book, I think you do so at your peril. Because Mark is just the man, you know, if there's a fact in his book, you know, it's been triple cross checked double checked and, right. and what have you and so i think it, it's it's a bit of a cliche to say it's the bible but it pretty much is and um so i i put a lot of stead in what he says and so i tried to use that as the base from which i i go and um I've forgotten what you you asked me now, <laughs> but yeah, I do, I do because I I wanted to be as accurate as I can, and I get asked an awful lot in my job, you know, just what did they write? People want to know what they wrote mm. in in the houses, and then not that clear themselves, John isn't you know isn't i don't think anybody ever sat them down and said tell us exactly what you wrote and so paul was very keen to big up the beatles when they hadn't made it he wanted them to make it mm. and so you don't hide your bushel do you or what you, you, you whatever this that saying is you 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 say, oh, yeah, well, we've done this, we've done that. We've. You make the most of maybe what was very little. And I think Paul was adept at doing that. And so some myths kind of grew. And more recently, Paul has said, you know, well, I, we were trying to get a deal. We were trying to become mm. what, what we... So what are you meant to do? You... you, you 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 big yourselves up, and that's the right. way to do it. And you cannot blame uh, him for uh, you know. I, I've managed to <laughs> abandon a singer songwriter, and when you've got nothing, you know you have to make it into something. Right. <laughs> so you do, and um, so that's what he was doing. And so I was going to resources, and of course. They weren't writing everything down. Paul's got a, a great memory, but um, they, they, it, it, you know, for, for the song. And so you go to wherever you can for your information. So with the songs in the houses, you, you, you come to realize that maybe at Mendips, John didn't write an awful lot. Um, you know, he wrote, he, he always says he wrote a Calypso. Calypso, Calypso rock. rock, yeah. But he he also said, it, 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 I realised that um, you have to repeat a song enough to remember it because I would wake up in the morning and I couldn't remember it, but I knew I'd written it. Mm -hmm. But I just, could, I, I just couldn't remember the lyric. I couldn't remember the chords, even whatever. So... It didn't. It didn't see the light of day, really. And then there was another one. My bird is like a. My love is like a bird with a broken wing. Yeah, I have that written down here. And so, consequently, that's all we have. You call that a fragment, right? I guess. But he's 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 maybe not as focused in in one way as as paul is paul is paul is much more dedicated to the course uh but he does come up with hello little girl right and by then he's met paul and john is trying to write he is he wants to write his own songs john is bright lad you know they're both the thing is about them they're both bright lads 
These are intelligent, bright lads who love the music. They're so focused in the music. They're immersing themselves in it. And they know who they like, Goffin and King, you know, Chuck Berry. They, they know and they've recognised that these people, you know, Chuck Berry writes his own songs, you know, Buddy Holly writes his own songs. So mm. they're getting into the thing of wanting to not just learn songs. They're not just recognising what is a good song. They're, they're wanting to create their own. Now that sets them apart. Yeah. And so they are beginning. And John... Um, writes Hello Little Girl which has got a lot of Buddy Holly in the original inception of that song mm -hmm. and he meets Paul McCartney and suddenly he he's found a kindred spirit he's found someone who is as much into that music as he is to the point they not only want to play it and live it and whatever but they want to create it and that that is cr a crucial difference to the other kids and guys he's playing with at the time in the quarry or that he's met. And, and so, yeah. hello, I, I'm going off the beam here, aren't I? That's okay. I mean, Paul has said in, in recent years, that's one thing that impressed him about John. Early mm -hmm. on when they met and he discovered that John had tried to write some songs and Paul yeah. said, so have I. And yeah. everybody and else just wanted to cover songs. Yeah, and that's it. He he's he said to his friend Ian James, "I've written a song. You know, I lost I lost my little girl." Right. And Ian James said, "Well, I was playing guitar, but I wasn't thinking of writing this song." And suddenly, Paul says, "I've written a, a song," and takes him to where the guitars are in at Fourthly and plays this song, and it kind of blew Ian James's mind, you know, because. What? We don't write songs. We we play other people. We cover. But he's got, and not only has he written the song, it's pretty good. Hmm. You know, it's a proper song. Right. So what can you say? John and Paul meet each other and they've got the same passion for the music, but not only that, they've got the same curiosity about creating songs that are as good as that they, and for John Lennon, I think, to share a song with another lad, he had to feel a confidence and he, he'd got that confidence in Paul as a fellow artist. Now we're talking something different here. Mm. It's one thing being a musician in a band and saying, right, well, we'll play this one because it'll get people dancing. But it's a different thing for a teenage boy, two teenage boys to put themselves on the line and say, well, I've written this. Because you, you're exposing yourself. Mm -hmm. Exposing yourself to the possibility that somebody might say, oh, boom it out. <laughs> to laugh at you. Yeah. But John must have felt that faith. And Paul must have felt that faith. And realisation that, that, that this is a kindred spirit. And so they share, I think it was, hello, little girl, and I lost my little girl. Yeah. And, and so... And I, I think this comes out of that that bond over Bud, Buddy Holly in particular, and because um, they're both Holly esque, very much of. so. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and I think that is the springboard to you, you know the writing. They've got that that pat on the back. They've got that. Yeah. Well, I like it. I like it. So. They can go forward with that because they've got that. Somebody saying it's good. It's worth you doing that, right? And that's what you need. You need somebody else. Somebody else's confidence in what you're doing, and that's what they gave each other. Okay, I'm going to ask a few esoteric things um, that you bring up early in the book, and if you could cite the source, that would be great. Um, that Ringo Starr was offered to join Jerry and the Pacemakers as a bass player? Yeah, I uh, I think I can't remember where I got that from. Um, but I think it's... Um, he was with Rory Storm. Sure, yep. And I think he, he was offered that by someone 
I could look in the book, but that that's was... okay. That's all right. But I just found that kind of interesting. The only way that that even makes any sense is because in those days, bass players played very simple stuff. It wasn't mm -hmm. anything elaborate. So it's not like yes. they looked at, at Ringo as possibly an accomplished bass player, but maybe they just need somebody in the group as <laughs> one of the members left. Oh, um, yeah, I, I don't know. But I mean, I would. Uh, there's so much in my book. Right. And that's going way, way back. Well, I've kept a lot of notes. <laughs> Anytime yeah, there's okay. something here that I've learned or I found interesting, I, I put notes down. Um, and about Hello, Little Girl, um, mm -hmm. John had apparently said that it was influenced by a song called Scatterbrain. Yeah, that was a song that his mother would have would have known and sang. And I think somewhere I may have the, what do you call it, sheet music for that, somewhere, I think. Um, in fact, somebody gave it me. And I think that's up in my attic. Um, yeah. And the song Scatterbrain was done by Frankie Masters and his orchestra in mm -hmm. 1939. You know, one of the great things about this book is when you're discovering songs that, that influenced or may have influenced the songs mm -hmm. that the Beatles wrote. If you don't know them, just go to YouTube. <laughs> Everything's on there and you can... Mm -hmm. you can listen with your own ears and see if you're hearing what John heard or what Paul heard mm -hmm. in these songs. But I love learning stuff like that. And apparently well, I, I think, think you got that from Mark Lewison too. But. Yeah. Well, I think John is influenced by his mother mm -hmm. and what she will sing to him as a child. I know he didn't spend that much time with his mom, but he did spend time with her and she did sing around the house and she did play. And so there would be significant tunes that she would sing to him mm. and that he would remember because he's a musician too. Even as a child, he's a musician. He's, he's got that ear for music. Right. And, you know, kiddies do remember tunes that they like. So that's what I think. All right. Well, according to your book here, um, what really captivated John about that song Scatterbrain was the rhythmic flow. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no telling when you hear a song how it can influence you to write your own song. It could be any any aspect of the song, whether it's a song lyric can set you off in a certain direction or yeah. the or the flow of the of the words. Yeah, so he, that must have been. I know, think John is listening for that. I think he, he had um, also, he, he loved words, you know, I think words were a big thing for John. Um, so I can't put myself in John Lennon's place, God forbid I can't, you know, and um, you, you can't put yourself in Paul McCartney's place, but they will, they are like magpies, you know, they're pulling in from all different sources. This is what artists do, isn't it? Mm. You know, there is no there is no artist who uh, does not draw from other sources, other influences. But it's what happens in here. It's how their brains interpret the sources and what they produce is unique. Right. Most, some people just copy. But John and Paul were unique in that they interpret things and it becomes their own. It's not a copy. It's something different. They've taken it and it, it's become their own, you know. So mm. and this is what John used to say, you know, he said, we all we all borrow, we all take, we all listen. We all. But it's it's what what they are able to do with it. And I think that says maybe they couldn't really explain that process because that's what makes somebody different to someone else. If they can explain it, they could tell you and I how to do it and then we could all become Lennon and McCartney, but we can't. <laughs> we can't. Well, it's a fascinating thing to try to get into their brains 
and figure mm-hmm. out how because I remember John would talk about I'll be back mm-hmm. and he would say the song was influenced by Del Shannon and I'm not sure if mm-hmm. he specifically said runaway mm-hmm. but somehow you try to process in your own head how did how did the song go from runaway to I'll be back there's something about that song that made him create from something that he heard in, in another song. So just trying to figure that out. It's it's a fascinating thing. Um, well, it's, I mean, I'm not a musician, so I couldn't do that. You know, I couldn't. Yeah. I don't think I, I could. I could sit here till next week and still be thinking, what? what? It's it's how he, he hears it. You know, as, um, as George Martin said, he, he John heard things that you others didn't. Mm-hmm. you know but say say Libby. all right i do want to point out one of the things one of the many things i loved in the book was that frida kelly made a contribution she wrote a little mm-hmm. chapter in there to talk about what it was like to see the beatles at the cavern well i interviewed frida about that because when i was writing the book uh, some people said to me it takes you a while to get to the song that the beatles <laughs> gave away <laughs> And I said, well, I know, but I wanted to contextualize. I wanted to show that they, you know, that as writers in particular and as a band, they just didn't come from nothing, that there was a journey to get to the point that they wrote and that they became the Beatles and, and the, that they were learning. They were, they were a covers band. As mm-hmm. Paul McCartney said to me, you know, we were a covers band first and foremost in Liverpool. That's what we did. We played covers because we wouldn't have got away with playing our own songs. The audiences wouldn't have, wouldn't have stood around to listen to songs they'd never heard. So we were a covers band and we were a good covers band. They mm. were Anyway, um, so I wanted, I had gone to the cavern as a kid, teenager, but I'd not been when it was a seedling, you know, when it was growing. Yeah. And um, I knew one person who had, and that was Frida. So I I said to her, can I talk to you about the cabin? And she said, of course you can come. And um, I did. And then I thought, what am I doing? Rewriting this, (laughs) you know, I can't. I can't rewrite it and tell it better. Right. So I went back to her and said, Frida, if I just write this chapter, you know, just tweak it a very, very tiny, tiny bit. But can I put it in in your words and, and tell people that it's your memory, that it's your chapter? And she said, mm, yes. So I did. I sent it back to her. She okayed it. And for me... You know, it's as, it's as good as any of the interviews with um, Paul or, or George Martin or Jackie Lomax and to have Frida's chapter yeah. in there, given what she became. But she was a Cavanite when the cavern was hmm. just beginning. Yeah, to me, that's like one of the one of the best reasons anybody could get this book was that chapter. Well, I loved what she said very briefly about how she enjoyed the lunchtime sessions at the cavern more than the evening ones because they were you know kind of a different band they were much looser in the afternoon and they took requests and everything was more controlled at night which i found to be very interesting i think it must have been almost like attending a rehearsal you know not quite but almost because they're taking requests and they can speak to them whilst they're on stage I mean, that would have been the time to see the Beatles, I think. <laughs> Before all the, the razzmatazz and the, you know, to to have that rapport w- with a band. Um, yeah. Yeah. Did you, the dynamic between them. yeah. Did you ever see the Beatles in concert? I saw them, excuse me, at the Empire in Liverpool. Okay. At the um, 64, 64. I feel fine. I think um, Hard Day's Night had been out earlier in the year. I feel fine. I went with, funnily enough, my friend um, was here yesterday. 
a chap called Gary, who played in the Ox and played the Cavern. Um, I helped get that group. The, the, um, I never got commission for it. <laughs> but anyway, we went to, uh, I, I went the Cavern, uh, went the Empire to see the Beatles. Um, Tommy quickly was on the bill. Um, Remo Four was on the bill. Mary Wells was on the bill. Um, she closed the first half. She was about the only one you could hear other than maybe a bit of the Beatles, a little bit of Tommy quickly when he said he was recording an EP, but mainly it was just a screams. It was so loud, piercing and overwhelming. And as a young teenage boy, I was shocked at the behaviour of the girls. Uh, you know, it was alarming, um, but thrilling and exciting. And wow. Huh. So was... did you didn't hear any of their music from the Beatles or? I, I heard you heard fragments. You heard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what they play. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, you know, uh, it, uh, long tall sorry, I knew they played that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> All right, let me bring up I'll Be On My Way. Because you say it's among the list of songs that Paul wrote in 1959. Mm. I wasn't aware that it dated that far back. How do you know it was that year? Well, I think it's down on a tape um, somewhere. I think um, that uh, it's... Was, was it one... I know that some stage that he he's starting to write i think this is another kind of buddy holly i always number. thought it had a buddy holly feel to it yeah i think it's one of those and they were occasionally taping songs at fourth Lynn. you know um, i don't know where they got the tape re recorder from to be honest um i've I remember an interview with someone who said that Paul borrowed a tape and that they would go to fourth and maybe maybe Mike would, would drum or Paul would borrow that, I don't know. Um, and it was maybe on that. All right. I'll have to investigate that further. Um, mm -hmm. Tip of my tongue, you said it was written as the follow-up to Love Me Do. I think it was. I think Paul went home, you know, uh, George Martin wants a follow-up and um, he he goes home and he writes Tip of My Tongue. He said to, to me that he wasn't really very satisfied with that song. He's, he always thought that it, the title was good, but he right. could never get it, get, get it to work. And, um, of course, John had come up with Please Please Me, which kind of played it well. We kicked it out at the ballpark really didn't it that was a much oh. more co cohesive song and um i listened to that the other day and i thought yeah i can see why paul thought it it, it it didn't work and i can't remember now why i thought it didn't work um but it's it's not a strong not one of paul's greatest songs but maybe if he'd have worked on it more that certainly i think george martin thought it needed more work to to tighten it up to shore it up into mm. it's a good song yeah. good line though on the tip of my tongue oh yeah but compared to please please me which kind of you know it's a bit bit raw bit it's a bit more uh how can i put it it's a tough tough love you know it's, <laughs> it's asking something which tip, tip of my tongue's a bit more tiptoe you know i don't know yeah i know what I you're think. saying um mm -hmm. you know it's catchy i just don't think it's it's, it's that gripping you know a song tip of my tongue mm -hmm. um and you do say in the book that the beatles actually used to perform it or for a few weeks after uh paul wrote it mm -hmm. for a few weeks mm -hmm. so yeah well they were being they were being encouraged by brian had realized you know that the way to make a bit of money was to play their own songs and the way to, I think, give them an identity 
that separated them from other axes. And Paul had recognised this. Colin Hanton told me that Paul had said, even in the quarrymen days, they'd go on, you know, maybe third, fourth, fifth act, maybe in a talent contest as well. Mm. And they'd say, by the time we get on the stage, they've heard our songs because all the other acts have played them. So unless we do exceptional versions, the, you know, or, or maybe they've gone on early and then other groups play them, unless you're not, you're not giving the, uh, the audience anything new, we, we ought to start doing our own stuff. Right. And Colin said, I never quite was never quite understood whether he meant write our own stuff or songs that others don't do. Right. So he said, but I'm pretty certain he meant write them. And we did have a go at one or two, but we never really fully incorporated them into our repertoire. Um, so to go back to your point, I think Brian who now has been introduced to people like Dick James and, and what have you, he's beginning to realise that the thing that will make, is, does make the Beatles unique is the Lennon and McCartney songwriting and that they're good at this. Mm -hmm. And so, tip of my tongue, it's a new song. Of course, perform it. Yeah. And Paul has often said that, well, in addition to writing their own material, they were very proud of the fact that they did try to put some obscure songs that they would cover, mm -hmm. B-sides from other artists as well. Mm -hmm. So to make them different from other bands. Mm -hmm. um, Hold Me Tight, you said, was a possible follow up to Love Me Do, which I never thought of it, you know, as. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. Yeah, well, I think. Nearly everything was a possible follow-up because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they they didn't they did have some songs from the past that they are going to give to people like um, the foremost um, and Silla. They did have, but but uh, but I think they were keen because they they're into their stride now as writers. I think they they didn't want to go back because the wheels on the bicycle are going round and they're going forward. So I think they think their new songs are better and they want to they want to go with the new stuff. And let's face it, the new stuff is, is crackingly good. So, yes, I mean, it always surprised me that they, they didn't put... I, uh, I saw her standing there out as a single. I mean, blooming heck, how yeah. many bands would pass on that as a single? You tell me, you know, how many bands would pass on that? That's why I often say that the whole story about the Beatles not wanting to not only release, but record How Do You Do It is mm. such a pivotal moment in their careers mm. and the fact that George Martin allowed Love Me Do to be the first single. Mm. I mean, if Love Me Do hadn't done as well as it did, and I know it only went to 17, but that's a decent showing. Who's to say what would have followed after that? You know, mm. so no, uh, um, you're right, Ken. I I think <laughs> I think the success of Love Me Do and and you know people say it only went to seventeen, but new band seventeen, respectable, respectable showing, mm. and it just gave them, it just gave them enough to say, well, you know, we've got, we've got a. Uh, 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 we we've got the ability to write and we will come up with something and they did and it, and it was a challenge to them it was a challenge to them and i think this is why they were coming up with things like tip of my tongue hold, hold me tight stuff like this they were they were determined that they would have the next uh, single and and um and i think george martin was coming around to their cause as well yeah. You know, he he was engaging with them, not just um, as the next act he's got to get us in, but as people, as a band. Right. He was beginning to see, excuse me, that there was more here uh, than than he'd realised. He'd been 
not dismissive, but he'd been mm, not totally convinced. But boy, he is going to become convinced. And when he is, there's no stopping him. He, he becomes their champion. Well, apparently, you know, from what Mark Lewison said to me, everything changed after Please Please Me. Oh, yeah. Because okay. once once George Martin suggested to them to speed up the song, because it originally was a ballad, and John said it was like a Roy Orbison song, once they uh-huh. sped it up, and George Martin thought, that's it, you know, he said to them, you've got your first number one record, mm. and he was right. So once, once they had a number one... Um, you know, everything took off from that moment on. Um, mm. This is another song, uh, This Boy, um, where you say the tune references Bobby Freeman's You Don't Understand Me and the Teddy Bears to Know Him Is to Love Him. Now, like I said before, if you don't know some of these songs, and I didn't know the Bobby Freeman one, it's a similarity, definitely, mm. but I didn't hear mm. it with um, To Know Him Is to Love Him, which, of course, the Beatles covered. Mm. So, mm. and John, too solo wise but where did you get that from did was that um maybe from uh, mark no it, w- it wasn't um that's from a series of records um that are are, are out there and uh, the they're called um the roots of the beatles I think they're called the Roots of the Beatles, and they 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 go through the entire uh, Beatles history, okay. and what they do is that they put out the records that the Beatles either listened to or played as covers, and they reference how these records can be heard in the songs that they wrote. And they're a fabulous series of records. And they are called, the. I think they're called The Roots of the Beatles. And they have fabulous um, booklets that, okay. that, um, that talk about when the Beatles were playing them and how they may have influenced the chord progression of a song that they wrote or uh, when when they were listening to them in particular so um had i known you were going to ask me that question i would have brought one or two of those to show you i i could Zoom up to the attic. I know exactly where they are in my attic. Okay, that's but, all right. But we, anybody, can listen to these songs on YouTube anyway. Yeah, but the, these these series of albums, the guy who does them, is amazing because he's done a similar series of albums for the Stones and other groups. And you, when you listen to them, you get the story of your favorite bands but you also hear from where they've come to where they go. And he's, his particular forte are the Beatles. And he's, these albums are, and you hear the originals, mm. but the booklets are gold because they, they are so well annotated and so well researched and full of photographs as well of the original artists and, um, yeah, I mean, for someone like me, someone like you, yeah, wow. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, they're, they're they're essential. I would say. Okay, I will definitely look into it. I will send you a link. Okay, and actually, send me the link, and I'll put it in our description box for everybody yeah, watching. Yeah, that, that. Any Beatles fans out there, these 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 albums are are, are magic, and they're they're just wonderful. I um. Yeah, I've recommended them to quite a few people, and you know they they all say, "Ah, oh, now we know how where you're getting information from." You know, they're brilliant. Okay, let me bring up. I saw her standing there by Duffy Power, um, who was part of Larry Parr's stable of artists. Very mm-hmm. interesting um, that they're backed by the Graham Bond cor- uh, quarter, Quartet. Sorry, mm-hmm. Jack Bruce is on bass and Ginger Baker's on drums. So you've got, you know. 
a little bit of cream there <laughs> before yeah. they became cream. And John yeah. McLaughlin on guitar, Graham Bond on Hammond organ. This was mm -hmm. released as a single February 20th, 1963. Um, would you say that was gifted to them? Gifted? I think it I think it was. Um, it's it's not what I, it's not. This is a, where I would say it's not a it's not a gift in the sense that it's not it because they themselves did it as we know. Right, it was the opening track uh, on their album, but it was definitely one I think that was given to um, there you the go. original sheet music. Mm -hmm. Can you see that? Yep. So there's Duffy Powell. Um, I think Duffy was persuaded to record it um, uh, as one of the early attempts by Brian Epstein and, and the, the Beatles management to, to get someone else to record a Beatles song, to, to push that Beatles, John Lennon, Paul McCartney song writing um, out there, you know, to make, make that uh, partnership known recognized and get some hits by other artists into the charts and i think duffy power was recognized as an artist who was trying to break away from the mold of being a pop star into a more into in, in, in to rejuvenate his career to, to start again if you like mm. and he wanted to be seen as a more of an r&b artist and they saw yeah. this song as something that could um, kickstart his new direction. Right. And so they put this fabulous band around, you know, I mean, oh, in heck. And, um, and so that's, and I, I think he had connections with the Beatles uh, recording team and they, they suggested it to him. Certainly John and Paul heard it because they, they weren't so keen on his interpretation, but um, it's a good record. Now, one thing that I'm a little- Made it, sorry. OK, I'm a little confused about one thing, which is, yes, I understand that the Beatles want their music to go out there. But I also thought somewhere in your book, you said that um, they didn't want other artists to cover their songs, the songs that they were releasing themselves, because that would be competing with their own records. Ah, yeah, well. They wouldn't with singles. Mm. That's the case with singles, because what was the 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 kind of form back in those days that quite often you'd have some people um putting out the same single same you know song right so that of course can mean that a record that's a really good record may not get to number one because there's two or three versions of it so different people are buying the, the song so Consequently, um, the sales are, are split, so it doesn't get to number one. It might might do well, but there may be two or three versions in the chart. So the Beatles realised that if they wrote their own songs and only they recorded that single, okay, there aren't going to be there aren't going to be competing versions in the charts. It's just their version. So all the sales are their sales. So it will get to number one if it's selling enough. So that's what they were trying to avoid. They weren't averse, I think, you know, to other people covering their songs. It was the singles. Because this happened, you know, quite a few times to, to songs released as singles that various people would record a, a song. Yep. Be, deny each other the number one maybe that that's what i mean by not wanting by writing their own songs it's not going to be one a publisher in denmark street is going to going to say to a couple of artists oh do this and then they suddenly find oh x has done it as well hmm. do you see what I mean? yep yeah big difference there um got to bring up the stones i want to be your man do you look at that as being something different because the Beatles knew already that they were going to release their version? Yes, they did. They did. They're, Mick Jagger says they were hustlers, you know. They were hustlers. 
John and Paul were hustlers. <laughs> um, and th they they were asked specifically, I think it was Andrew Oldham, really, who, who'd worked with Brian Epstein. Uh, that's another example of um, them giving a song, but they knew that Ringo had done it and that their version was going out on an album. So it's not competing with their version in the charts in the sense of embarrassing them maybe by getting to number one or higher than them. Mm. Yeah, and so th there's no competition there in a way, but it could be, it could, would earn them extra royalties in the singles charts. You know? So I don't, that's an, an example of where they'd be happy to see that in the singles charts because they're not going to release it as a single. Right. Makes all the difference in the world. That's the mm -hmm. idea of what the single is. Yes. But, uh... it, it, yeah, that, that was never going to be a single for them. It was for, for Ringo. And they'd written it, I think, with him in mind and uh, with Ringo in mind. And, of course, the Stones do that. Great Elmo James guitar, you know. It's, do you love the Beatles? Yes, we do. Do you love the Stones? Yes, we do. So, but... Yeah. Stones, Elmo, James version is, is of I Want to Be Your Man has to be the best, do you think? Do you think it's Well, I'm, I'm, I'm partial to the Beatles here, but I love both versions. Mm, I love both versions, but that slide guitar when it comes in and you see the Stones performing it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Which Have they... I betrayed myself here? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. Oh dear, I might get the sack. <laughs> our guest <laughs> has been <laughs> yeah this is almost like the same case of billy j kramer with do you want to know a secret it's the exact same thing really yeah it is um and i like both versions i i, I do, <laughs> I do. Mm -hmm. but billy j um yeah he, he's got there's a certain certain something about billy j's version of that song which um I, I like an awful lot i like that double track on his voice and um but george has got a certain um i don't know what it is it's a, a certain naivety about his vocal and uh, yeah but I, I i i don't think you can compare these two uh, versions really and um, i like the way that uh, the the arrangement that George Martin brings to bear right. on Billy. I think he's he, he's arranged it to be a single, if you like, know what I mean. Mm -hmm. it, it's an ent it's a single entity, whereas George, you 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 just get the feeling it it is an album track, and that's what it is. You know. Okay, it was a hit in the United States, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it would be, wouldn't it? And um, yeah, it's it's good. And it's a great introduction to George, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk about uh, Jerry and the Pacemakers. They turned down Hello, Little Girl. They did. Well, they did a version. Oh, Hello, I know, Little... which which came out more recently. It, it didn't come out when they first recorded it, right? No, I don't think so. I think no, there was a... Hello, uh... Was it not the How Do You Do, uh, do It? I mean, if you see what I mean, the Beatles did How Do You Do It? Right. But it's their kind of, we don't want to do this, so let's not do it too good. So lacklustre version. Jerry Arch. Jerry's a strong guy. He's, a, he's, the, he's up there with the Beatles in Liverpool. He doesn't want to be making it on the coattails of the Beatles. Mm. So doesn't want to be making it on a Beatles song. So lacklustre version, not not bad, acceptable. Right. But not as good as it could be. Not as <laughs> not as Jerry and the Pacemakers as it could be. <laughs> um, so I think it's a bit bit it's the equivalent of how do you do it? by the Beatles. Hello, Little Girl by Jerry and the Pacemakers is the equivalent. It's Jerry, in those days, don't forget, we didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know what was going to become. Right. And I, I think there was a bit of rivalry. And I, I'm sure 
that Jerry wants to make it in his own right. And so when he does How Do You Do It, my God, how does he do it? He's great. He's got this wonderful voice and um, he sparkles on that song and he makes it in his own right. And I think um, I think that's the story there. I think. Yeah. I think pretty soon. Now, there, there's a little anecdote that I've told a few times here and it's oh. something that I realized a few years ago. Um, and in learning about a little, little girl and that Jerry and the Pacemakers did it, which happened to be released on a, on a best of Jerry and the Pacemakers collection several years ago, if you ever want to listen to it. Um, but it seemed like some of these artists, all Liverpool artists, when they tried to get their way, it turned out to work out the best for them because the Beatles didn't want to do How Do You Do It? They ended up releasing Let Me Do, became a pretty sizable hit. Um, when uh, Jerry Marsden didn't want to do Hello, Little Girl, because they, the story that I heard was that he'd already had How Do You Do It and I Like It, both up-tempo songs. He wanted to do a ballad. So he did mm -hmm. You'll Never Walk Alone. And lo and behold, was a number one hit. You know, there's a lot of people that sometimes associate You'll Never Walk Alone as you know, the most memorable song of Jerry's career. You're a little Woodling, you know, there's Ferry Cross the Mersey too, but, you know, everybody associates You'll Never Walk Alone with Jerry Marsden. And um, so he stood his ground. He told George Martin and Brian Epstein, I don't want a little girl, look what happened. And Billy J. Kramer didn't want to get the next Lennon McCartney song, which I think was one and one is two. No, no. Or was it Hello, Little Girl? I'm in love. Oh, I'm in love. Okay. And he wanted Little Children to be a single. And they recorded it. It became his biggest hit in the UK, right? So every time that these artists, you know, stood up to Brian and George... It worked out for the best. And in the case of Billy J, he told me many years ago, and you have it here in your book, that he kind of felt like his relationship with Brian was never the same after that. Yeah. Even He's, though he did so well with little children. <laughs> well, Brian's an ego in his own right. Uh huh. Yeah, he is the impresario. He's got these guys where they are, and um, they've listened to him, and then suddenly they don't listen to him. They stand on their own two feet because they've gained confidence. They've gained ascendancy. And it, it's difficult, you know, when you're managing groups and singer song and, and that um, it's very much a marriage. And it's it, marriages don't always run smooth. And, right. um, and I think I think this is this is kind of what happens. But I, I it, it, there's also the the ego the, but, because these are all guys who know each other in Liverpool. Mm. And I think I think there is the thing of not wanting to make it on just the back of the Beatles or and Jerry was a very strong character. Right. And he and the Beatles were neck and neck in, in Liverpool. Because you know, this is before we all know what John and Paul can do as songwriters. You know, you've got to remember, you've got to contextualize it within what's going on in Liverpool down the cavern. And across Merseyside, you know, in in the Mersey Beat poll contests and that, right? Um, and so, yeah, I I think I think for whatever reason, Jerry feels he's number one in many ways, mm. and um, yeah, I don't think. Billy would ever have said I was number one over anybody over the Beatles, but uh, I think he's he he is aware that he is being fed songs by John and Paul, who I don't think minded doing that. I think they 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 were quite happy to do it. You know, I think they enjoyed that relationship. Mm. But on the other hand, he, Billy most probably realised at some stage he has to step out. And kind of be counted as it were. And he found that song. 
little children. And, yeah. and that kind of established him as being in control of his own career in some ways. That he's got an ear, he, he knows a good song when he hears one. So, yeah, you know, ego, you don't stand on the stage and not have an ego. Hmm. You've got to. And Jerry definitely did. Billy, quite quite shy um and so it was a big thing for him to stand up to brian epstein but he did do it because i think he knew he had to at some stage yeah and his confidence in that song was supreme it's such an interesting part of this whole story because i understand you want to step out on your own on your own you don't want to rely on Lennon and mccartney but at the same time you're hot at the moment. You want to keep the momentum going. Having Lennon McCartney there on your record has got to be a plus no matter what. So mm -hmm. uh, to, to you know, stand your ground was very, it's very impressive to do that, but it's a big risk to take and they took them. They, they did. And um, yeah, well, I mean, I'm really pleased that Jerry Marsden recorded uh, you'll never walk alone and i'll be singing that tonight <laughs> okay <laughs> because liverpool are playing real madrid um oh, and you always hear it. the song is, it, is that play. there is that their like theme song yeah that's the song yeah. that the liverpool football club have played ever since uh, jerry wrote it and uh, not wrote it sang it rather recorded it yeah um it uh, became adopted by the uh, liverpool fans and it's played every time Liverpool walk onto the pitch at Anfield, and all the scarves and the cop ends, as they call it. Mm. You know, it's one of the most glorious spectacles in um, the, the the Premiership in in um, in Britain. Well, you know, just <laughs> and Jerry will never be forgotten in Liverpool because of that song. So when he rejected, <laughs> he did the right thing. It's immortalized him, but it, he's immortal anyway because of his his career in Liverpool as a singer. Wow, right? Okay, just one more thing about Jerry. I noticed that um, George Martin and Brian Epstein got Jerry and the Pacemakers to sign with Columbia, and I'm figuring because she hears so much about George Martin not really being happy with EMI, not getting paid that well, there probably wasn't that much loyalty to EMI. You would have thought maybe if you're part of the Brian Epstein, George Martin team, that maybe yeah, yeah. It wouldn't... Columbia was part of EMI. It was one of their labels. Okay. I'm thinking about it in America, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, no. EMI was the parent company of Parlophone and Columbia. And there were right. one or two. Of... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's talk about Tommy quickly and tip of my tongue. That was mm. someone that no matter how many times Brian tried he couldn't have any success with him really no and he tried and he definitely tried um, most probably down to the material I think I kind of go over this quite a bit in my book um, Tip of My Tongue was maybe not the best ever Lennon and McCartney song Tommy did something with it. I think he, he, he cut a very good pop song with it. Why it didn't make it, I don't know. He cut another very good um, pop song called Honky Tonk Angels. I didn't know they made Honky Tonk Angels. And um, those two are the pinnacles really um, in between some pretty not great songs, really, you know. Um, I, think, I think there was one called Humpty Dumpty, something like that. Um, and he was a bouncy personality. Uh, he, he, uh, but for whatever reason, he didn't gel with the general public in Britain. And he didn't have hits. And he did it all the way that he was told to do, the suits, everything. But 
just didn't happen. And he was very young. I think he'd been with a band. I think they were called the Challengers. I'm not. Uh, um, but Brian took him away from the Challengers and put him with another band, the Remo, for people like that. And I think in doing that, he took away Tommy's um, comfort, comfort blanket. You know, he took him away from what gave Tommy stability, security. And he was maybe just too young to be taken away and put into this world of show business where suddenly he was the focus of everything and and it, it just didn't happen. And of course, as I suggest in my book, not me, but based on interviews that I found with those who knew him, he was a little bit insecure and a little bit swayed by what was going on. And it, he couldn't handle it without someone there to, to say, hang on a minute here, Tommy. This, this isn't the way to go. And, um, you know, they, they tried to cut, I think it was um, no reply. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think John was in the studio and whiskey went round and Brian was in the studio. And then it must have seemed for Tommy like, oh, God, this is it. You know, this is such a big deal. And it's, and it was maybe too much pressure. And okay. it, it didn't work out. They never went back and finished it and it didn't work out. And, and I, I think Brian lost faith in him. But for whatever reason, it didn't. I saw him at the Empire on the Beatles show. Tommy quickly and he, yeah. he came on and the girls were going crazy, but they were going crazy anyway because they were anticipating the Beatles coming on. So they, when they heard that Tommy was recording this EP, they, they, they gave it even more, you know. And, um, yeah, you know, he had that confidence on, on stage. So I don't really know, except I think the songs weren't good enough. After Tip of My Tongue, the next few songs weren't good enough. And by the time he got a song that was just edging into the charts, Honky Tonk, I didn't know they made Honky Tonk. It, 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 it just didn't get the push to push it fully into the charts. And uh, that, that was it. Nems didn't renew his contract. Seems like there were a number of reasons why he didn't go as far as he should have, but um, yeah, true. And and Brian was really frustrated dealing with him because I think I he think saw so. a I lot think, of potential in him. I think he did, and I, I. But I think in the end, it it just too many things just didn't work out that Brian possibly assumed would. And maybe, just maybe, um, Tommy needed a much greater level of support than what was there. All right. Talk about Billy J. And as I said before, I feel really lucky that I've been friends with him since the 80s, and I've interviewed him several times. And um, he did contribute to your book. Massively. And, Massively. Um, you know, he's one of the, there's three artists that I that I that I would call the big three. <laughs> and that would be Billy Jay and Peter and Gordon and Silla Black, who benefited the most from definitely several Lennon McCartney songs. Um, you know, it's it's in part due to the friendship that Billy had with the Beatles, but I think he recorded the most Lennon McCartney songs. There were I think more he songs did. given to him than anybody else. Definitely. And you know, um, I'll, I'll, I'll be on my way. Um, bad to um, me, bad to me. Uh, I'll keep you satisfied uh, from, from a window. And from a window, uh, yeah. And do you want to know a secret, like we mentioned earlier? 
Yeah, that, and, and I, I'll call your name. Right. Although those two weren't gifts in the same way as right. the others I've mentioned. But um, yes, he did. And he was, a, 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 as, a, as a, a musician, he was a lifelong fan of the Beatles from seeing them in Litherland Town Hall when they came back from um, uh, Hamburg and had been transformed mm -hmm. <laughs> from being um, a, a band that weren't that impressive in Liverpool, um, so I'm told. But they go to uh, uh, to Hamburg and have this transformative experience and come back and blow everybody out the water. And the, the gig at Litherland Town Hall is the one where this is fully um, realised in Liverpool. Suddenly people think, wow, um, we can't compete with this. <laughs> and um, Billy is there. And as a young man, a young musician, he um, he's totally in, inspired by what he sees and hears. And of course, they, they don't look like everybody. He said to me that all the acts in Liverpool are wearing the suit, but not mm -hmm. the Beatles. They, they don't even look like the rest of us. They look different. They've got the leather. And uh, they, they don't behave as, as we do. And uh, they, 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 they give have this dyna dynamism and this energy and these harmonies. And uh, they, 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 yeah. so inspired. And I, th I think he became almost like this young younger brother, <laughs> almost that the, the Beatles take under their wing, particularly John, who loved Billy's voice. Mm. Now you know that that's something because even even George Martin said said to Bob Harris and I you know you know Billy didn't have the strongest voice but John liked it he always liked Billy Jay's voice and Billy was a little bit insecure and so to have someone like John Lennon as your champion well that's 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 something else. Billy, Billy has Billy changed his name. You know, he's 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 not Billy Ashton. He's become Billy Kramer. John said, "Oh, you know what? He sounds better if you put a J in there, Billy J." And it does. Mm -hmm. You think Billy Kramer, Billy J Kramer? It's just got a ring about it. And right. It's just one of those little ways that John is kind of mentoring um, Billy, and so. Yeah, he, he they offer him, do you want to know a secret? And George Martin produces this and he adds more to it. He spends more time on it, I think, than the George version. I think this is the difference. You know, he double tracks that voice. Mm -hmm. And um, he, well, he, he produces it because he knows it's going to be a single. So it has to be a little bit more distinctive, maybe. Mm -hmm. And um, and Billy J takes it from there. Let's not forget forget that J it's it's not all the Beatles. It's Billy J is the artist, right. and he's got the look. He's a handsome lad, and um, the girls like him. <laughs> the girls definitely liked him, and um, yeah, his career takes off. And then John will write "Bad to Me" for him. Which has got a bit of a blueprint of. Uh, do you want to know a secret about it? You know the spoken intro, and all of that. But it's a cracking song. I th I think this is one of those that the Beatles give away that they themselves would have turned in a, a pretty pretty good version had they kept it. Um, and Billy, uh, I I think of all his singles from each. Uh, sorry, from a window mm -hmm. was. Pretty really damn good, but bad to me is the classic Beatles song. You know that somebody else does. I think it's great. It stands okay. up to this day. It's a wonderful pop song. Mm. Oh, I agree. I can certainly mm. hear the Beatles doing some of these songs that they gave to other people. Mm. And there are bands 
Like there's one from Seattle called Apple Jam. There's a band that I'm friends with, The Weaklings, where they cover a lot of uh, songs the Beatles gave to other artists and obscure tunes. And and some of them could really work as Beatles arrangements. And I do think Bad to Me is certainly one of them. I love From a Window and I'll Keep You Satisfied. And in particular, I'll Keep You Satisfied. <clears throat> you said Billy thought like his career went downhill after that because it didn't perf it didn't perform on the charts as as well as he hoped it would i guess he had a lot of high expectations for i'll keep you satisfied but that song and from a window did okay just nothing as as big as uh bad to me and little children mm. and do you want to know a secret mm. but he you know billy billy set the bar high for himself he was so self-critical mm. And I think, I think most probably around him, people was because because I'll keep you satisfied is such a good song, and it's another one of those that the Beatles could, you know, it's another one that you have to say so they gave that away, um, they gave that away, and it, it's another one of those that um, I bet you, people around him within the industry, you know, were, were saying, oh, this will be this will get to number one, this will get, and he himself is most probably thinking. Wow, I'll keep you satisfied. Bad to me, you know, got to number one or whatever. I'll keep you satisfied. Apparently, didn't get to num number one. Did it? It only got to number two in the trade papers. I don't know, but he's thinking number one. And when it doesn't, he kind of beats himself up. Mm. Feels like he let people down. And you know. You look at the charts, and I, I can't really remember what was in the charts at that time. But my gosh, to get in the top five at that time of year, Christmas, I think it was stunning. And in actual fact, when he appeared on the London Palladium, that song sales rise. But he says my performance there wasn't good. But when I look. The sales figures and and it didn't that that version of events didn't tally mm. um so he was a great interpreter and from from a window it was a lovely song and, and billy's version is, is wonderful it's an it's a lovely paul song i agree paul sings the the high note at the end yes he does because billy had a cold <laughs> <laughs> That's another thing about your book for everybody watching. It's loaded with all chart facts. Mm. You know, how mm. how high all these songs peaked. Um, so if you're into that kind of thing, especially since a lot of these songs charted in the UK and didn't chart here, and actually you put mm. that in the book too, if, mm. if they didn't chart in the United States. Mm. Um, well, I've got a lot of friends in the USA and I, you know, and I know that some of them will be thinking, well, we never heard of this. And so I wanted them to know. And and the other thing is that here in the UK, I, I'm confused. I mean, I'm confused because I'm an old man, but I'm confused because when I was a kid growing up, I used to read uh, the New Musical Express or the NME that we called it back then, mm. or the M Melody Maker, MM. And we'd get this from school, you know, okay. doing well. And the enemy was the one where you, you'd find out when the tours were happening and who was coming when and all of that. So it was a great thing. It was a great thing. But it wasn't a trade paper. The trade paper was record retailer. And they, they had a much better handle really on how records were actually selling i think enemy went to a certain number of shops and would phone them up and say um what are your top selling records this week and then they put a little chart to put their charts together record retailer had a much wider range of had a much greater input from actual sales so we kids we teenage lads lasses we um we relied on the NME. So Please Please Me went to number one in NME and Melody Maker, I think. So we always believed, and I believed throughout my life, that Please Please Me was the Beatles' first UK number one. Mm -hmm. And I still do to this day, but apparently it wasn't. It was from me to you. 
which upsets me a great deal. Yeah. Only <laughs> because, because because it wasn't it wasn't <clears throat> please please me wasn't number one in record retailer. It well it was wasn't it? No, it wasn't. Please please me wasn't number one in record retailer, but it was in NME. Right. Yeah. So the the trade paper, which apparently was a more accurate. Uh, had a more accurate chart because it, mm -hmm. it went, it got the, the the sales figures from more reliable sources or a greater number of resources. It said no, didn't get to number one. It got to number two. Um, NME, however, had it at number one. So we kids who for whom NME was the Bible, number one. So when they put out one that yeah. album. And please, please, me wasn't number one. We all we protested. We wouldn't buy it. Well, we did, but <laughs> there was a bit of a protest, you know, because yeah. it, we told our kids, "Please, please, me was number one." And then they said, "Dad, look, you're wrong." It feels like a gaping hole, you know. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't. It doesn't sound no. right. No, you know to go from love me do because it was number one in the u.s yeah, yeah. you know and then from me to you anyway anyway um, <laughs> sorry sorry diversion. it's okay yeah um the foremost recording a little, little girl mm -hmm. obviously jerry and the pacemakers rejected it well they didn't want it as a single so it went to the no. foremost and that was a huge hit for them yes it was a the, 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 I think they had two top ten hits, and that was one of them. Mm -hmm. they, the, the, their follow-up to Hello, Little Girl was I, I'm In Love, which was mainly written by John, and they did a lovely version of that. Um, mm. And then they felt, I think, the need to diversify, and they, they went with um, A Little Loving, which was a big the, the top five hit for them, mm -hmm. and um, they were they they were another act that had been signed to um, the Maca uh, sorry the uh, Brian Epstein stable, if you like, a strange word really, isn't it? But stable of stars, M Nems, mm -hmm. and uh, but then uh, they they did find it a bit hard to get top 20 hits they had a few lower region hits but great great liverpool band very popular very popular with the beatles close to the beatles because of their great sense of humor you know they, they were very good mm. nice guys good band great band why do you suppose they weren't able to maintain success longer and again maybe choice of material maybe i don't know you know times changed and it's not just the music that changes; it's the 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 appearance of a band, the way they look. Its styles change. You know, R and B came in. Uh, we we went through an R and B stage. You know, um, and uh, the Mersey beat boom died. Basically, it faded, mm -hmm. and suddenly, whereas everything had to come from Liverpool, suddenly it didn't, and other things came in the 60s you know things just changed it did become the r&b boom you know with bands like the stones the pretty things then acts like that and that was not the foremost right that was not the foremost and maybe you know they, they didn't adapt or they didn't look the part and so although they kept putting out records and kept performing um they were no longer hip, I'm afraid, with a record buying public. And that's the harshness of the pop business. The, you know, you, you one day you're there, mm -hmm. and the next day you're not. Well, the 60s were a period of constant change. Oh, yeah. So you had to keep at it. <laughs> you did. To stay you on did. the charts there. And that's the, the beauty of the Beatles, and that's the beauty of having an act that have their own songwriters and are tuned in the, to the zeitgeist. You know. mm -hmm. Let's talk about one of the, the, the most obscure 
um, artists, Mike Shannon and the Strangers. And mm -hmm. um, they came from South Africa and yes. they recorded one and one is two, which Rodisha. was rejected. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one and one is two being rejected by Billy J. Yes. And um, yeah. How did they get to record a Lennon McCartney song? Well, I'm not too clear. <laughs> I think it, it's all it got, in the book, but yeah, it's all in the book. Yeah, it got rejected, I think, by so many um, yeah. that their management must have got a hold of this song, and um, they they were in London. They'd relocated to London from. They were they were, Rhodesian Zimbabwe, as we'd now call it, um, it, 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 but they played a lot in South Africa. But top of their game, big band out there. Um, but they they realized that if they wanted to make it on an international scale or in a major way, the place to be was London at the time. So they relocated to London where they tried to establish themselves as as a, a as a music act um, of of some stature. Uh, by playing the, the the club scene in London and doing a bit of a tour of um, Europe. And my feelings are they were also um, very well known by the oh, one at this point, my mind has gone blank. Um, the chap who established um, um, oh I can look it up while, while you're thinking. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had a ship on the anyway. He he was a songwriter. Um oh, my mind has gone blank. I am ever so sorry to all your listeners for this. That's but okay. He he managed the animals. Okay. And he Rack Records, R A K records and i saw him on a blooming tour and he sang mr basement <laughs> i can see him now but anyway they'd known him because he'd been in south africa mm -hmm. as an artist singing and he had lots of hits but he also relocated to uh to london uh and uh, they knew him but they'd also met Billy J. Kramer in Europe on one of these tours. I think they'd given Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas a lift home because Billy J.'s vehicle had broken down. So my belief is that through Billy J., they had been, they had been given a link to the Beatles management or to Dick James. And this is how they came to be gifted. Okay. Were you thinking? One. Were you thinking of Mickey Most? Mickey Most. Okay. Yeah, Mickey Most. Yeah. And so they knew Mickey Most. They had a contact in um, in in Britain because hmm. he was a huge record producer in um, in Britain, and um, so. They knew Billy Jay, and I asked Billy Jay about them when I was doing the book, you know, and I thought, but he couldn't remember. Couldn't remember. But Billy Jay had been offered this song and rejected it. Mm -hmm. And the foremost had. But am I thinking are oh, that maybe as a thank you, but I don't know, and this is pure speculation, that maybe they had become aware or their management had got hold of, of the fact that this song was there and um and they were able to record it because they'd signed to um Philips records i believe mm -hmm. here somewhere in my pile and they were desperate i think to to make the charts because what they lacked was a hit record. They were getting lots of gigs because they were a very good band and very competent. 
and um, they needed that hit record and it, it got good reviews but yeah it just did not sell enough copies to make the British charts and they made a, a follow-up single which is also very good but it didn't it go just anywhere didn't go anywhere hmm. and at that point I think they um they they couldn't sustain staying in in Britain and I, I think they'd been a band that had had lots of hits in South Africa uh, in Rhodesia but they'd been trying and they'd been on, on on the go as a band for many years but you know you do this and you have success in your own country but you're aiming high you want more success but there comes a point where you you can't keep doing it and feeling that you're not really getting to the point where it's worth it anymore so they 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 went back and um, basically the band disbanded um but the story is all there in the book. It's it's one of the saddest stories because you feel that here was a band who had what it took and success just was always one step away, real success. Uh, but they didn't, they didn't make it. And um, they made a good shot of it. It's a good, good version of mm -hmm. a song that, that wasn't maybe um, one of the, the, the best. Can I go and just pull the blind down? Sure, sure. Because I'm being blinded by the light. <laughs> certain Mr. As, Springsteen might say. Yeah, it does say in your book that yeah. um, that the band loaned the animals their own uh, musical equipment when they had <laughs> to record House of the Rising Sun. Yes, that's true. Found to be quite interesting there. Yeah, that's that's one of the little stories I found. Um, that they they loaned them this pristine equipment that they had. You know, they took it all around Europe and they <laughs> had it in London. They, you know, they loaned the animals because they knew Mickey most. Uh, they loaned uh, the animals their equipment when they went into the recording studio because when the animals went in to record House of the Rising Sun, uh, their equipment wasn't good enough. It was too bashed about. Hmm. And Mickey said to Mike Shannon and the uh, strangers, oh, could we use your? Oh yes, of course you can, but they get it back, <laughs> and it had been through the mill uh -oh. of the animals, and was no longer pristine. We weren't very <laughs> happy about. <them. laughs> so, um, so yeah, but so, so they had that claim to fame. That's our equipment on that record. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway. hey, they're on a number one record in a way. Yes, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. For for Americans that aren't familiar with her, she was such a big name in your country. Explain Scylla Black and the success that she had in her career. And she got three Lennon McCartney songs in there in her career with um, Love of the Loved and um, Step Inside Love. And it's for you. You know, well, what can I say? <laughs> Explain Scylla Black. Scylla Black was part of the fabric of the 60s in Britain. Scylla was the girl who was one of the component parts of Mersey Beat, hmm. who stayed the course, you know, when Mersey Beat, the bubble burst, Scylla was still there. And she remained there for the rest of her life she was she became what what you might call a national treasure she became um more than just a singer you know she she hosted television shows and um she had a great sense of humor and she was always down to earth and she had this great scouse accent you know and the, mm -hmm. <laughs> she was she was just someone we all loved I, i'm just see if i can find a very quick picture Mm -hmm. yep. There's Scylla with the sheet music for Love of the Loved. I only recently just bought that. 
I've been searching for it for ages. Okay. And she was a singer down the cabin, young girl who loved to sing. And uh, she she had a great R and B, bluesy kind, jazz type voice. You know, she she could sing loud, mm -hmm. <laughs> loud. Uh, do you do you know Lulu in the states? Oh sure, yep. Yeah. So she love. Would, yeah, yeah. She she could sing in that category. Um, she had a tender side, but I guess she could. Uh, you know, she, she had that wake up call when she uh, went for it. And um, she she used to uh, go down the cabin, the Iron Door, all the clubs in Liverpool with her friends. And her friends would uh, say to the bands on stage, Priscilla's here. Her name was Priscilla, actually, but no, right. Priscilla. And they would say to the bands, uh, why don't you let Scylla come up and sing? And um, difficult to refuse, Silla. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she would uh, she would often get up and sing uh, with um, Rory Storm, and they had a drummer. Oh, what was his name? <laughs> oh God, I can't remember his name. What's his name, Ken? It might be Richard Starkey. It was, that's the guy. Mm. And she would sometimes sing, I think it was Boys or something with him or something like that. Uh -huh. Anyway, she would sing, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, she was a well-known singer in Liverpool. So when Brian Epstein is building his um, stable of stars, he does want a girl singer to be one of one of the stable and um and um so Stella became that star mm -hmm. and um so he wants a song for her and so as as has become what he does he turns to John and Paul for a song and they've got a song called Love of the Love that they've been singing down the cabin. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit of a belter, you know, a bit upbeat. So they say, well, why don't you, you give this one to, to Scylla, Love of the Loved? And so they did. And she, she said to Paul, she said, well, this wasn't a new song. You used to sing this down the cabin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, she they got a bit of a jazz kind of big, well, not a jazz band, a, a big band. Yeah. you know dance band uh and she uh she she said um george martin spent quite a while with me uh tutoring me so that i didn't have a, a scouse accent there uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and um and he she said he was right because this was my first song and she, he, he wanted my enunciation to be to be good and so she sang this and it took her into i think it got to number 35 so maybe not as big a hit as brian would have liked as Scylla would have liked but it broke her into the british charts and um she then was gifted but baccarax anyone who had a heart that had been a huge hit for Dion Warwick. Sure. I don't think Dion ever <laughs> forgave Brian Epstein for this. Um, but Scylla went to number one in Britain with anyone who had a heart. And she stole the hearts of the British public with this song because it was yeah. beautiful. She did it so wonderfully. And suddenly she's part of Mersey Beat. Love of the Love did open the door but it's anyone who had a heart that that established her. And from that day on, she was not just part of Mersey Beat. She became part of the fabric of British entertainment. And she followed up anyone who had a heart with uh, You're My World, which was an Italian 
song with an English lyric, and that went to number one. Right. Boy, <laughs> she sang, she sang that. She really sang that. And from that, that that's it then. She has hit after hit, including um, It's For You, right. which is one of John and Paul are listening. They're listening to Scylla's voice now. And they wrote that for her. And what a great song that is. That's that's another one I think they could have done. But it's written specifically for her. And so what you hear now with this song, I think, it, a, a little bit like Bad To Me for Billy J. John and Paul as writers for other people, mm. not writing specifically for themselves, the Beatles, but writing for someone else. Yeah. And it's, it's really good. It's for you to me has a very theatrical feel. Yes. And I, I could hear like a Shirley Bassey or someone like that singing mm. that kind of song. So, mm. yeah, um, so different. <laughs> mm. Than uh, mm. Love of the Loved. And she also said she wasn't happy with Love of the Love with the arrangement with the brass being used. And she mm. wanted it to be more of a rock sound on that. She did. But, uh, but I think, you, you know, she, George Martin had been to the cabin. And um, he, I, I'm not sure whether he heard her down the cabin, but he would have had, by then, he would have had a, a report of what. Silla was like as a singer. Um, mm -hmm. He said to me, she had a, this corn crake voice. And um, he, um, he he knew he had to give her a, 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 an arrangement that made the most of what was a very strong voice. And the other side of the coin, of, of, of that coin, was that she had she had um, great control and quite a tender voice. And so when she became the first girl singer in Britain to have her own television show, Paul wrote for her Step Inside Love because mm. they were trying to give her this big band song yet again. And he said, no, 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 don't go with that. Go have a song where you're inviting the audience into your space. Make it intimate. Don't don't go with a big brash bang. You know? So he wrote Step Inside Love. Mm. And it's a much more tender song. And the, the original recording of that can be heard um, on, on a, a kind of compilation of Silla's in which it's just Paul on acoustic guitar right. and it's just Silla Step Inside Love. And it, it's, it's wonderful and it shows what control and what, what, what a tender voice she had as well. Yeah, and the, the Beatles recording of Step Inside Love has come out during the White Album period. So, yeah. You know, one thing about Scylla, and, and because of the passing of Burt Bacharach, I've been watching a lot of interviews with Burt Bacharach. Not only did Scylla cover Anyone Who Had a Heart, but she also covered Alfie. And when you're dealing with Burt Bacharach songs where there's a lot of wide intervals in the notes they're not easy to sing at all there's a reason why Dion warwick is a great singer if you can if you can do the burt Bacharach songbook mm. <laughs> a lot of his songs are so challenging to sing vocally and you got to give credit to Scylla for doing the same thing with alfie yeah. and anyone who had a heart so you know he came and george martin said to bob harrison and i you know he he took a long time with Silva over Alfie, but she was there for all of it. And whenever he said, do this, do that, she she did it. And um, he was a perfectionist. And Silva didn't, didn't let him down. Mm. And so what can you say, you know? She, she was, uh, we're very proud of Silva here in Liverpool. Yeah, you know, you, you always hear, I would love to be a fly on the wall at a Beatles recording session. Mm -hmm. I'd love to be a fly on the wall with Scylla Black, Burt Bacharach, and George Martin in the same room. Yeah. <laughs> that must have been something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about uh, the Applejacks and Like Dreamers Do. Really, uh, 
this is so funny the irony behind mm. that recording that it was produced by mike smith yes and the beatles did like dreamers do for decca with mike yes, smith they producing they, yes they did and um well, Mike Smith was the guy at Decca who wanted to sign them, but was uh, overruled by Dick Rowe. Rowe, yeah. Yeah. Um, so he gave it to Brian Poole and the Tremolos. Um, and Mike Smith had been up to Liverpool and auditioned the Beatles in Liverpool. Mm. And really, when they went to Decca, I think that was more a commercial recording technique test you know it was was not an audition as such they'd already passed the audition that's why they were invited down to to cut a commercial tape from which a single should have been chosen but um anyway um the apple jacks were a band from solihull near birmingham and um very young some of them were still at school when they got their recording contract to cut a song called Tell Me When, which was um, a, a, mm. big, a big hit for them, but still very young. And one of the things that intrigued the British press was that the bass player, Megan, was a girl. Mm -hmm. It just shows you how primitive it was. You know, it was a big deal to have a girl on bass. So, you know, oh dear. The press make a big fuss of it, and um, and uh, anyway, they're looking for a follow-up, of course, to tell me when. And um, the Beatles are in um, the same um, television studio, not in the same studio as uh, the Applejacks, but the same building. And their paths cross. The Beatles are making a, a television special called Around the Beatles, mm -hmm. which featured PJ Proby, of all people. Um, Jet Powers, as he was known in the States. And um, I think in the canteen or somewhere like that, they come across the Apple Jacks. Okay. And they are going to talk about being hustlers. They're going to offer the Apple Jacks, like dreamers do. And the Apple Jacks are recording for Decca, which is the very label that had rejected, ultimately rejected the Beatles mm -hmm. all those years ago. But now, and of course, the thing about like dreamers do is that when Brian Epstein has got the Decca tapes, and being rejected by them, he actually had the songs from the Decca audition made into acetates, 78 RPM acetates, because he was being told it's much better to have records than tapes to take to record companies because they can just slap them on the record player and play them. Mm -hmm. And what he'd done was taken these to um, a publisher called Ardmore and Beechwood, and Ardmore and Beechwood had played like dreamers do and thought, whoa, here's a song we think we could do something with. This is a good, this has hit potential. And Ardmore and Beechwood wanted to get the publishing for this song and they wanted um, they wanted this song. They thought they thought this had hit potential. And Brian wasn't too au fait with publishing things and all that. He, he didn't spot what an opportunity this was. But um, to cut a long story short, um, it was Ardmore and Beechwood who really persuaded Parlophone or, or EMI to record the Beatles and specifically that song because they wanted mm -hmm. the publishing for like dreamers do right now obviously the beatles did get recorded by emi on the parlor film label and ardmore and beachwood got love me do and um, ps i love you and got the publishing for that but they never got like dreamers do but the song that really persuaded parlor 
or um, EMI to sign the Beatles was like dreamers do. So now, these few years later, there's mm -hmm. Paul McCartney, who's always got these songs still in his head, offering like dreamers do to the Applejacks who record for Decca and Mike Smith is the guy who's going to be in charge of this. So it's gone full circle. Right. And the Applejacks are going to record like dreamers do and have a hit with it, top 20 hit. So <laughs> there's and, a certain irony in this. And it's a great version of it too. Right. And also, you say that the song was never published by Ardmore and Beach, but it went to Northern mm -hmm. Songs. It did. It did. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it, it proves that Ardmore and Beach would knew their stuff. Just mm -hmm. as Paul did as well. Yeah. But it always it, it begs the question, and I asked Mark Lewis in this when Tune In first came out with this whole story about Like Dreamers Do, why didn't the Beatles record it? Well, I don't know, maybe too many songs at that time. And, um, you, you know, you'd have to ask Paul McCartney that. I, I think maybe they just had enough songs for that first album. They'd got, I, I saw her standing there, they got Misery, uh, There's a Place, and, uh, you know, yeah. they, they, they've they got the two singles and two B-sides. And uh, they 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 also are going to put a few covers on there. I mean, let's face it, a twist and shout on. Wow, but we don't want to... Paul yeah. never talks about Like Dreamers Do. And if Ardmore and Beachwood were so keen on wanting that song, why wasn't that a top priority? <laughs> did he Did he know at the time? Did anybody know? That Was it ever sense. mentioned? I don't know. Because hmm. did George Martin want them to know that this was the song? I don't know. I I, I don't know. Yeah, I've got no no clue on on that one. I I must admit I've always thought, well, why wasn't it? You know because. Why didn't Ardmore and Beach would say, well, no, you know, the song we wanted was like Dreamers Do. Right. But they weren't, they didn't pay for that, those songs to be recorded, but they're, they're, it was their enthusiasm and their belief in the Beatles that got, that alerted Len Wood at Parlophone mm -hmm. to, to get this band signed. And, you know, there were other reasons as well why I wanted them to be signed and George Martin to record them. Um, so along the way, things changed, you know. Okay. All right. Um, still got a bit more to go through. We'll try to, to speed things up a little if we can. Um, okay. You mentioned PJ Proby. That means a <laughs> lot. Hmm. And uh, interesting thing about that recording uh, Jimmy Page is on guitar, and John Paul yes. Jones is on bass. So just like mm. the Graham Bond Quartet had two mm. members of what became Cream, you got two mm. members of what eventually became Led Zeppelin <laughs> on that. Record. I think they were session musicians at the time. Were they sure, not? they were. Yep. But um, I know Paul has never thought that much of this song. You know. No, no. I mean, they tried do what they could it was a very specterish kind of uh, production that the, the, the unusual kind of sound for the Beatles but they something about it they didn't like because it was uh, it was for the soundtrack of help right and um yeah it didn't didn't cut the mustard as we say in Britain um for that it, it doesn't sound like a help soundtrack song in, in some ways, well, it doesn't, and so consigned to the uh, the outtakes kind of, mm -hmm. and along comes PJ Proby, and PJ wanting a hit or a song, things are not going his way at the time, and he's become a friend of the Beatles ever since appearing on Around the Beatles. 
and he has got a cracking voice. And um, asks, have you got a song? Yeah. And Paul remembers that he has got a song. <laughs> <laughs> or he he hasn't got the time to write one, but he does, does know that there is one in the can. And uh, the Beatles haven't been able to get something that they like with it. So maybe PJ could. And, mm -hmm. and, and Proby could. And Proby was a writer in his own right. You know, he, he'd already um, furnished a song for The Searchers, Ain't Gonna Kiss You. And he'd been on their program and he, he was part of the Brian Epstein stable by then. Mm -hmm. he'd, oh, well, he'd been signed by Epstein. So he gave, he, he said, well, we've got this one. Um, Paul actually described that to Bob and I for our program as a, hor you know, as a horrible, he said, it did, or our version was horrible. Hmm. Which I don't think it is actually, but he, he said that. But, and, um, but, but PJ made something of it. And he does. It's, it's not a bad song. I think it's good. You know, but there again, I would do. I, I think it's an all right version. Um, but it it didn't it didn't um, set the charts alight. That's for sure. It was I can't remember now, but mid thirties, lower thirties, okay. didn't hang around. But his career was also very short lived. Well, he's still going. <laughs> he's well... still in Britain, and he still occasionally does these. Um, silver 60s well it'd be golden 60s by now yeah um he he came on he, he came out like wow you know he he he, he was jet powers in in james smith i think his name james marcus smith or something like that in america and um he uh, he'd recorded a few songs for Sheely Smith, was it? Um, no, um, Eddie Cochran's wife, okay. girlfriend, girlfriend. I've forgotten her name. All right, Sheely. that's okay. Anyway, Eddie died, obviously. Yeah. And um, but it hadn't really happened for him in America. But he had a great voice. I think he sometimes sang demos for Elvis. He had this great versatile voice from rock and roll to ballads. Hmm. Kind of a good looking lad in, in a, you know, good looking youth, attractive youth for girl, the girls liked him. And I think Jack Good was aware of him. And he was, he was employed to make around the Beatles and they wanted someone from America, I think, an unknown and then so they got jet powers to relocate to england to appear on the show but they decided that he uh, he needed a bit of a makeover new name new star that, that this would be his chance and he went with it and he changed his name to pj proby and um, he appeared on the show and he gave it all he got and uh, he looked great. He looked a bit like a pirate, you know, had the, the hair pulled back into a ponytail, which was unusual for the time. Um, and he had the uh, the flowing um, kind of op open shirt at the top that didn't tuck into the trousers. Again, unusual, um, a bit piratical. <laughs> and the girls, the girls did go for him. And the next thing is um, he's a sensation and he makes this record called uh, Hold Tight. Uh, oh, sorry, Hold Me. Yep. Hold me, baby, on you hold me. And he follows it up with, um, uh, oh God, what he follow it up with anyway, another one. A cracking, really, you know, tour de force records. Mm -hmm. And um, and he, he he goes on tour with Scylla, double header. Um, I mean, an amazing package tour, Scylla Black, BJ Proby, this wild boy from Texas who, um, he lives the life, you know. And um, they're gonna do this 20 day tour, 14 day, I don't know, of, 
of the UK. And um, and I think uh, Silla's going to close the show, but PJ is. I've got the, got the program somewhere. Let me have a look here. Mm. <laughs> and I maybe not. I maybe not have the program in this particular book, but I have got the program. Give me a sec. Okay. Yeah, "Hold Me" is a really great song. Oh, in fact. Um, many times when I've seen Billy Jay in concert, he likes covering that one. Yeah. So. And a, a wild guitar. So I don't know whether you can see. Yep. Okay. There you That's go. That's an origi original program. Wow. Okay. okay. And um, <laughs> the wild man, wild man of pop. <laughs> <laughs> um with the live a bird and um they go out and uh, pj has the stage suit um and it, it incorporates uh, 14 pairs of trousers uh and he starts going out on stage and a few numbers in the trousers start to split and uh, accident because he's so wild and gyrating yeah. And it drives the girls crazy, you know. And uh, then the next night, the trousers split. This is why he needs 14 pairs. Uh -huh. Anyway, the press get hold of it. And um, they start turning up at the shows. And then the, the, the moral majority in Britain uh, start saying, this is, this is awful. This man shouldn't be doing this. You know, mm -hmm. he shouldn't be, his trousers shouldn't, shouldn't be splitting. People shouldn't be seeing what they're seeing. And anyway, in Northampton one night, um, the, the police are at the shows anyway because they're there for security because the girls are trying to mob the stage in those days. Um, it didn't matter who the stars were. People would be trying to get on the stage and, you know, put their arms around whoever it is but they're trying to mob PJ when he's on stage and of course his trousers are splitting so it's even worse <laughs> and uh, anyway he goes on stage and he's he's said it's an accident he doesn't mean to do it he just gets carried away and uh -huh. you know, somebody goes on stage in Northampton and lo and behold stage uh, goes on stage trousers split can you believe this? Curtains open, and there's a, a police constable Harris Bryn Harris to arrest him. You know, <laughs> decent exposure, really, I guess, or whatever it was. On stage, end of career, really. You know, he's he's, he's going to be banned from um, going on package tours and is not going to be allowed to appear on the BBC, which is a big deal because this is how you promote your records. Right. And um, and that was it. And, um, and and that was Bob Harris's dad, that police. So, so poor old PJ putting on a bit of a show, which, you know, maybe he should have wised up when the press are all there on the front yeah. row. <laughs> but couldn't help himself. That's, well, that's what happened. Anyway, I'm sorry, it's such a long story. That's okay. I guess the, the trousers were too tight, right? That's why they split. They did, you know. They should have got a bigger size. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. Has he maintained a, a sense of humor about this through all these years? I mean, it's a long time ago now. Has so, he? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but... You know, he, he's a great singer, and he he did he did have he had a hit with somewhere out of West Side Story in Britain. Oh. He had a big hit with that, and his follow up record though after this was I Apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and he yeah he's a, a colourful character, and um, but it is a shame because he did have a great voice. Mm. And um, but he's kept going, and he he's appeared in um, uh, on in Jack Ru Jack Good Productions, you know, and he's appeared on yeah. Again, it's all in the book. Okay, 
Mm-hmm. Very good. Yeah, I've, I've read all these stories, but I'd rather have it from your mm-hmm. mouth. Yeah, it, 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 to me, he's one of the those guys who this shouldn't have happened. A career shouldn't have been torpedoed by a pair of trousers that kept splitting, you know, uh, a waste of what could have been, you know. These days, that would be considered nothing. No, no, exactly. Mm. That's the sadness of it. Um, one of the most fascinating things I read in your book, because I never mm-hmm. heard this before, this concerns the music that Paul wrote for The Family Way. Oh, and yeah. Melody was called Love in the Open Air, um, which you actually mm-hmm. consider this a giveaway. Um, yes, yeah, so, because he, he's writing it for a film from me. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and it says here that John initially said that he and Paul were going to write the music for the film, but in the end, only Paul did it. And well, that, this, ups- this, that upset John a lot. This is what I discovered during the um, the dark times of COVID when I started researching old um, newspaper uh, interviews. This is what I discovered from interviews with John. And um, I think there was a radio interview with someone from America. And I hadn't been aware of this either. That, but, but they're in the book. John says, you know, I, I'm going to get back from filming how I won the war. Right. And be starting writing this film with, with Paul. But Paul had written it, I think, whilst he was still filming. Right. Yeah, and apparently Yoko told Paul this, that John was really yeah. upset. Mm. And um, Paul was unaware about it. Yeah, I, I, it, it appears so. It appears so. And, um, and possibly the first or one of an early division in their relationship um and the the other thing is i didn't realize that is that paul split the money with john on on the writing huh. um of 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 the film but yeah and and again george martin said to to bob and i that he he had to go round in the end to get the uh the piece the finished piece from paul and he had to go round to Cavendish, um, where Paul lived. And when he went round there, John was there. And in front of John and himself, Paul finished the piece for him because he needed it for the to arrange for the film company. Right. So John sat there whilst Paul finished it in the melody on the piano. And as, yeah. as George Martin said, I've been pestering him. And then eventually I had to go around in person and, and there he was and he said, oh yeah, better. And just sat there in front of myself and John and just, that's the genius of the man. He just sat there and finished it. And what can you say? Right. And somebody who can just do that. And so quickly too. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also... So that, that is a remarkable story, I think. You noted here that... Um... George Martin scored Paul's new melody at CTS Studios in London and at the same time worked on five sessions through three days for Strawberry Fields Forever. Imagine that. (laughs) Working on both projects at the same time. Yes. I mean, Paul is the consummate musician, I think. You, 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 you just have to wonder at at how gifted he is to be able to do these things and at the drop of a hat. I mean, I I sometimes when I'm working at Mendit, and I sometimes, you know, in the past have stood in at Fourthland or when Sylvia and I were both doing the jobs, we'd swap over. Mm. And you stand in that little room and you think the genius that came out of these houses 
Right. And you think of Paul sitting at the piano and writing the melody for when I'm 64 or suicide or whatever it was. And, and you think, wow, wow. It's just incomprehensible, really, that they were living so close and that they found each other. It's, it's, it always takes my breath away, even though I've done it for all these years. It's still something that blows me away, you know. I feel so privileged, but just to think of those two two young men, it's it's just brilliant. And I understand why people come from all around the world just to yeah. stand there because you think, yeah, what pleasure and what a gift to bring so much pleasure to people. He just reminded me, you know, here in America, James Corden has his show, his talk show. Mm. And he went around with Paul to Liverpool sites and went into Fourthland Road. And Paul was there at the piano playing a little bit of When I'm 64. Were you there or, or Sylvia while that was going no, on? No, we weren't. You know, he turned up unexpectedly and he went in. Another lady was there um, who substituted for Sylvia. It was our day off. Oh. Yeah. Can you believe Shouldn't have taken that day off. <laughs> well, we have to, you know. We mm -hmm. we work five days a week. Um, I know, I know. It was difficult. Um, I wasn't there when Bob Dylan. I mean, I was there when Bob Dylan turned up. So, and that was out the blue. Mm. This is Fourthland or or Mendips. Mendips. Okay. So that was that was something to stand in uh, John's bedroom with Bob. I mean, I. I thought, wow, is this happening? <laughs> and it was. It was. <laughs> well, because we'll save this for another show, I think. Yeah. We gotta, no, we gotta talk a lot about Mendips and mm -hmm. Fourthland Road. Um Cat Call, Chris Barber Band, a favorite recording of mine. I always remember the first time I heard this, which was on a compilation of songs Leonard McCartney gave away, and it had a real Herb Albert and the Tijuana brass feel to it. And I mm. love the instrumental, which many of us know originated as Cat, Cat's Walk. Yes. Yeah, one of those early Hawthorne Road instrumentals that they put down. I, I think they were mainly Paul. There's one called Winston's Walk, which just because it's called Winston's Walk, people say, well, that must have been John's, but I think it was most probably Paul. Mm. I don't know why, I just do, I think, you know, I just do, but I've got no reason to say why I think that. Right. Uh, can you talk about Jackie Lomax? I mean, you talk about someone who really should have had success and had so much bad luck. And I love, I really love the one album that he made on Apple, Is This What You Want? And yeah. it's such a shame that that didn't take off the way it did or that Sarah Milk C wasn't the big hit that it was, but. It's uh, promotion. And it's Alan, what's Klein. his face? Alan, Alan Klein. Alan Klein coming in. It's, it's, all, it's always a question of being it, it, wrong time, wrong place. The one time Jackie is in the right place at the right time is when he gets signed as a writer to 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 Apple. Mm. And George says, let's make an album. You're going to make an album and I've got a song for you. But for it all, for the rest of it, I mean, Alan, Alan Klein is putting back I mean, possibly, well, he did have to because they were losing so much money, but he cuts back. So there's no promo for uh, Sam Milksy. And, um, and instead of being the hit that it possibly should have been, it isn't, it, it dribbed out. I mean, on the other hand, it's released at the same time as Hey Jude and... Um, and, those were the uh, days. Those were the days. But it's also released in that group of four with Finger Me Bob and um, by the brass, the, the Black Dyke Mills band and Sam Lucy. And whereas two of those records became massive, I mean, massive worldwide hits, 
thingy bob and sound book see sank without trace and the, it, why sound book see sank without trace i cannot say it, it's because it was not promoted i mean a record with eric Clapton, george harrison paul mccartney and ringo on drums mm. what and maybe they couldn't promo those people because they were contractually signed to other record labels or some of uh, Eric was. And maybe they couldn't make a big deal of that. Um, but I, it was a great record. And it was it, it beggars belief that it, it wasn't. But that, I don't remember at the time that it got a lot of promotion. And I was very heavily into the... Beatles at the time and as a young man buying whatever I could that came out and uh, and I remember the record and that, but I don't remember a lot of fuss around it you know um, and I think this is what Jackie told me you know that there wasn't a lot of fuss and uh, that the, the the trade papers that, or, or the music papers um, couldn't be seen to just be promoting Apple releases because they had, you know, loyalties to all the record, you know, companies mm -hmm. and artists and on other labels. But it does seem, it, it seems like one of the great lost opportunities, really, that that record wasn't a major hit and that his album didn't. I mean, I... I should imagine a lot of people never even knew the album came out. Right. What which a is crime. again a tragedy. A tragedy. It is. And Jackie is such a nice guy, you know, such a lovely guy. Deserved so much more the, the, the success than I mean he was successful, but he deserved he deserved to be one of the artists that's really remembered from the the sixties. And the Undertakers were a great band here in Liverpool. Yeah. They were a little mm. bit different, play a bit more soul type music. Than, yeah. yeah. You do tell a story in here, which I wasn't aware of, that um, the Jackie did perform Sour Milk Sea on the David Frost show. Mm. And he had a backing band. Well, George wasn't there for this, but Clapton was. Mm. Ringo, Klaus Foreman, and Nicky Hopkins. But they were covered behind a curtain. Most probably that's the very reason I'm talking about contractual. Yeah, you know, they couldn't couldn't uh, you know in those days it wasn't um so easy for artists to appear on other people's records and i think that's I, that's the only reason i can give for it really hmm. or maybe they were trying to make a star of jackie and they didn't want the presence of other people to distract i don't know who knows but why the hell wouldn't you want somebody to see you with those people that could have really, I would, yeah, that yeah, could I have would catapulted have. the song right there you know yeah people see that yeah because they think wow if we buy this record we'll get to see this band again i don't i don't know hmm. all right mary hawkin you got to talk about uh okay. I, I i'd love her voice i've always loved her voice very mm -hmm. you know judy collins ish mm -hmm. so very pure, pure. And, um, you know, to me, I, I would have wanted her to remain a star for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Love Those Were the Days, which was a massive hit worldwide. And mm -hmm. um, there is Goodbye, which Paul wrote for her, which was a, a number two hit in the UK, top mm -hmm. 20 in the US. And she also mm -hmm. had more success, which I think is important to bring out because... Um, she recorded certain singles in different languages. Yes, she did. She was she was somebody who had the world at her fingertips. And um, but I think she was she was an artist who had great in integrity, and she recognised, I think, that she a career could go one of two ways. She could become a pop star. Where she knew her, her her forte, her talent was was in kind of folk music, and 
and in music that had some substance to it that she could believe in when she sang it. And that is what she wanted to do. And I, I don't think, you know, she wanted to be singing stuff that she felt w was fluffy, tri trite, that she wanted to have music that she believed in when she sat on the stage or stood on the stage and sang and introduced it. She could talk about maybe with the audience. I'd, I'd, again, this is, again, from what I've learned from reading interviews with her and just looking at the way that, that she did go. And I, I, I think she made a decision that she didn't want to compromise in the end. And she'd had the pop success, but she didn't feel that comfortable. Mm -hmm. And it's a big decision for artists to make, you know, because there's a pot of gold to be had from going down a certain road. Mm. And I think she must have made quite a bit of money with what she did. But on the other hand, um, you, you've got to live with it and endure it. And also she'd started a family and that's another thing. Uh, it's a different ball game uh, when that sort of thing happens. But <clears throat> definitely, I think... Uh, um, she, Paul wanted her to record that Doris Day song. Hey, Sarah, Sarah. Hey, Sarah, Sarah. And for a start, I think she would have known that how do you separate Doris Day from that song? That is Doris Day's song. And um, she didn't want to do it, you know. She did record it. Um, but she didn't really... Yeah, she. I think she just felt that was not the direction she wanted to go in, and um, I think Paul was a little bit unhappy with that at the time. And uh, so, yeah, that, that, that drew her to a kind of decision, really, about what she wanted to do and what she didn't want to do. And and postcard, the album was a very much different kettle of fish to the next one that she made. And she maybe didn't have very much control over Postcard, although she liked singing the Donovan songs on that. Right. She felt at home with those songs, but not some of the others. So I think all the time she was being pulled in two directions. And then in the end, she thought, I've got to... I mean, I'm putting my thoughts here. Mary Hopkin might have a different perspective on this, but I think she felt that... I'm being pulled in two directions and I know the one I really want to go on, the one that I feel comfortable with, the one where I feel not so compromised as an artist. And no, she, she I, always I, felt she belonged in folk music. That was, that was her thing. Yes. Or, or in that kind of genre, you know, and, and she's got a point because, you know, an awful in, in as the seventies progressed and it went into the eighties, um, folk and uh, folk rock and stuff like that, that became a, a very uh, potent and uh, successful genre. Mm -hmm. And she was more than um, equipped to to uh, be a major star in that. Um, but that's not to detract from <laughs> what success she had. I mean, she yeah. was massive. She was, you know, and she she's, people still remember her and she, um, you know, she she uh, achieved so much success and still remembered for that. People still remember Goodbye, Never Mind Those Were The Days. It was a great pop mm -hmm. song. You did it yeah. so well. But, you know, it, there's so many ways of looking at it. You got to do with what you're comfortable doing. And the follow-up mm -hmm. album to Postcard, Earth Song, Ocean Song, mm -hmm. is a stunning mm -hmm. album. It's all the songs are just so beautiful. They're all mm -hmm. sung so well. The guitar playing is great. Mm -hmm. And Tony Visconti, who is the, the the guy who, well, she ended up marrying, but he produced mm -hmm. that as well as, you know, Bad Finger mm -hmm. music. And well, I, I think I think it's it, it, it's 
it's the album where she's at ease with herself and she's got some control she's she's expressing her true voice if you i don't you know, by that i mean what's inside her heart and her head mm. and i i think that's that's that that you so you've got postcard and you've got that album yeah i think you've got the two roots and she decides to go the tony visconti uh, song type way and um and I, I think Paul had moved on as well. He he um, he felt he'd done as much as he could. Yeah, um, you know, and the Beatles were breaking up and possibly diverted by that as well. But he, he, you know, he a magic moment. Not many people can say that she'd worked as intimately and as closely um, in a studio uh, uh, with with. Paul, as she can. Yeah, and you also got to give Paul a ton of credit for hearing that voice, knowing he could work with it, thinking those were the days would work so well with that song. And she's such a young girl, but mm. that is not a song for a young girl, but he recognized that she could handle that. Mm. She had the, 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 the voice and the expertise and the, the skill. Yeah, he saw something in her that the was beyond her years and uh, I, think, I think that was brilliant yeah. yeah and Paul really I think envisioned her as being more of a standards singer Broadway shows and that's mm. what you know a good part of postcard was mm. so mm. and I think she did a great job on that too so yeah oh she, whatever was put in front of her she could handle but it is again when you've got a long term career ahead of you you've got to go with how you feel comfortable, where you feel comfortable artistically, mm. you know, right? Ultimately. Because you're the one going out there every night singing those songs. A few Not more artists, <laughs> yeah. Hey? I was going to say a few more artists that we have to cover. Um, talk about Mortimer. Uh, well, there's... Mortimer was a song I discovered really when I was writing the book about these guys who, um. Fortuitous, to say the least, you know, they're, they're working away uh, in um, New York um, and they they um, they happened to get um, a, a contact with um, with John Lennon. They, they, they've got their album um, and they go around or their, their tape and they go, they happen to know that John is staying with Nat Weiss, Weiss. Weiss. And, Weiss. And they, they go round to his apartment and how they gain access, I don't know. But uh -huh. they get up there and they happen to get the door opened by Nat himself who says, I'll give this to John. Who's in there? They're partying, I think, inside. The right. And he gives them they give him a tape. And most people would think, oh, yeah, I'm sure, you know, we'll go straight in the bin. Mm -hmm. But he did. He did give it to John. And John must have heard something in it. He must have played it. Because Mortimer then have decided that they're going to go to London and try and make it in London. Mm -hmm. And that's that was quite a bit of the story of the 60s because a lot of American artists, well, I say a lot, but people like Jimi Hendrix, who's pretty well known, Walker Brothers, they're making that journey to London to try and establish themselves in London, to, to cut a career for themselves in London and did so with spectacular success. So they come over to London and uh, they're trying to make it in the in the in London. And they it, they, it hasn't happened for them in London really. Not really. But they are about to go back to America when the day before they decide to go to Apple 
and they knock on the Apple door and they ask again if they can leave some stuff for somebody to listen to. Mm -hmm. And they, they, I think they get turned, they say, oh, yes, you can. But they, they say, no, well, we need someone to hear it now because we're going, we've got plane tickets tomorrow. Hmm. And they go into a room and they're playing their songs when George walks in. George Harrison. Yeah. And immediately says, sign them. I mean, this doesn't happen, does it? This is no. untrue. This cannot be happening. Sign them, give them a deal. And dances out the other door. So obviously they're not going to take the aeroplane out. And who they play it to is um is is um Mal. Who okay. is Mal Evans. Right. Now, Mal has been the Beatles' roadie mm. since the cabin. And Mal is working with um, Badfinger, as they will become the Ivies at the time. And um, so they get signed to Apple. And they make a record with Peter Asher. Mm -hmm. And Mortimer make a record with Peter Asher. And um, Peter Asher has chosen a, a, a song, I think, as a single. And he happens to play it to Paul. And Paul doesn't think it's suitable as a single. It's one of the songs Mortimer have written themselves. But he, doesn't, but he says, I think I've got a song that is more suitable as a single. And he's just written a song that he's just recorded an acetate with John. And it's called The Two of Us. Actually, it wasn't called The Two of Us. It had a different title then. On Our Way Home. On Our Way Home. And so he says, I think this would make a more suitable single for them. So he gives that to Mortimer to record for their album. And they recorded, a, a, a de I think it was a demo version, really. And they, I think they were always intended to re-record their version, but it was recorded for their album and was going to be the lead single. Mm -hmm. So here's a band who have come to London. It hadn't worked out quite the way they wanted, but last ditch effort they go to Apple where George Harrison hears them tells tells the company to sign them mm. he's so impressed just through walking through a room I mean John Lennon first of all had given the 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 demo from America he'd been impressed George Harrison is impressed they get signed to a deal they get a, a record and a single made, and these are about to come out. They're walking on in the dream ticket. Mm -hmm. Enter Alan Klein. <laughs> You're losing money, Beatles. You can't put this record out. You can't put this single out. And so Mortimer are told the deal's off, you know, nothing's going to happen with this. And poor old Mortimer, I think one of them got into the office with Alan Klein and tries to plead with him, tries to tell him, you can't do this, this is not possible. Mm -hmm. Our whole future depends on what you're doing. Please don't do this. But Klein is resolute and refuses to give an inch. And the record was shelved. And it never came out. And, um, 
they went back to America and basically they, they quit the business apart from one or two of them, I think, who played on um, Van Morrison's Astral Weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the record came out a few years ago. It did. A, you know, you can get it these days. I think, I think it might be in my little box of tricks here, but maybe not. But, but it's it's available and you can hear it. And Peter Asher took the photographs because he produced the record. He took the photographs on the on the lake at his house. Yeah. Put them in, in a boat. It's quite ironic, the picture, because there's these three guys in this band, in a little rowboat on a lake in the middle of nowhere, and you think, kind of sums it up. Quite sad, really. Mm. But Alan Klein. Again. Mm. You know, uh, we talked about irony here. Um, before this band was Mortimer in their earlier years, they were the Teddy Boys. Yes, they were. And they were on Cameo Parkway Records. Mm. And Alan Klein cut them. Oh, yes, of course. From yeah. their record contract there. Yeah. So it's like, my God, how many careers has this man affected and, and destroyed? Yeah, you know? yes, I, I forgot that. And, and this. There's so much in this book that I wrote, and I've been writing it so many years, and I've gone from uh, I was I was just 21 when I started writing this book. <laughs> it's a become, long process. <laughs> yeah. Become an old man. All right, we'll just do two more. Of course, you got to bring up Badfinger, which to me I think is the most tragic story in rock when you consider, you know two great talents committing suicide, all the bad luck they had with their manager. Um, I've maintained a friendship with Joey Molland, which I treasure. And I've, I I had him here on, uh, on my channel, right. as a matter of fact. But um, of course, Paul wrote, come and get it for the band, for the Magic Christian, George Harrison he did. Um, he did. produced four songs from their straight up album. But say what you want about, about Badfinger because um, such an incredibly talented group that despite the success that they had should have been 10 times bigger than they were, in, in yeah. my opinion. Well, here they are. That's the sheet music anyway, it's mm. maybe not. I, there they are. Okay. Badfinger. Right. Well, a Welsh group, and um, they uh, they they'd fallen under the wing of Mal Evans at um, Apple, and they were feeling a bit hard done to at Apple because they 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 put records out at, under the pseudonym really of, of the Ivies because that's what their name was mm -hmm. um, as a group and um, they, they'd, they'd been around quite a bit as a group, they were well known on the London scene as it were and they um, they were um, living with another group in, in London called the Mojos and their manager, Mojos were a Liverpool band and it wasn't happening for them at Apple. So um, they were interviewed, I think it was by NME, or one of them was interviewed. And he griped a little bit about feeling a bit left out that uh, their albums weren't pr promoted or their, their single, uh, their records anyway, they, they, they felt a bit left out. Mm. And Paul, read this and I, I think maybe it was done to um, to maybe just uh, alert Paul that they were feeling a, a bit hard done to and he said that one night he was just in bed and uh, he got this song in his head and it was come and get it and um, he knew instantly that this was a hit record and I guess only if you're Paul McCartney or a songwriter of that caliber, you hear a song and you know 
you've got a hit. And so he is going to go into the studio and record this song the next day. I think John Lennon was actually in the studio and uh, they were waiting to do some recording that day for the Beatles, but Paul had this song and he wants to record. And he, he's been commissioned to write some music for this film called um, The Magic Christian, in which Ringo is starring with Peter Sellers. Uh, but he, he thinks, I'm going to give this to the Ivies and this is going to change their fortunes at Apple. Mm -hmm. This is going to be their first really big single. I know it because I can hear it. And so he will approach them and say, I've got this single and I've done a, a demo for you. And if you follow this demo to the note, to the arrangement, you, you'll have a big hit, but don't change anything. And, um, and that's what he did. But he also gave them the commission that he'd been offered for the film to write the other songs. I mean, an act of generosity that goes mm -hmm. beyond just giving them a song. It It's giving them a, a, a film commission as well. But he's adamant, don't change a thing because <laughs> this is the hit single. And they didn't. And they have this massive hit single. And of course, it goes into a film um, uh, sound track. And they do get the commission to do the other songs. So they get the soundtrack. So that's financially, that is a, a door opener. And it's right. a saving moment for them as a band and uh, of course they go on and in the meantime Paul also says I think one of the things that's holding you back is to name the Ivies and the band themselves recognise this because sometimes people say are you the Ivy League were you were you the Ivy League and it's a bit old fashioned and, and they're not the Ivy League and they had never have been the Ivy League. Mm. so they change it and, um, and there's all sorts of um, names that come up and um, they choose Badfinger which I, I believe had been the name um, that, that John had had for a song um, With a Little Help from My Friends Yeah, with a Little Help yeah. from My Friends Bad had Finger a, Boogie Paulie, Paulie Finger when he rec yeah. recorded a demo uh -huh. uh, on piano and they, they went with that um, and of course it began a career and, and what it opened up for them was that people listened to their stuff and they listened to the other things on the Magic Christian soundtrack and recognised that the Ivies, Badfinger, were good writers themselves. You know, they had a trick or two up their, their sleeve. Hmm. Um, Without You was a song they wrote? No, they, well, yes. But, they wrote that and Harry Nilsson had yeah, a, a I mean, number one hit with it. Yes, and, I mean, they... Yeah, you know that as Paul said, that was a pretty perfect song. So, Badfinger themselves were amazing songwriters. So that song, "Come and Get It," opened the door for them to display their talents to the world and what talents they were. But unfortunately, they had dreadful management who ripped them off. Mm -hmm. I think I can say that without getting sued. <laughs> um, I hope not. And They're not alone. The, yeah. They're not alone. Instead of the money going to them, yeah. they, well, they didn't get it. Yeah. And um, that was always the tragedy of bad finger. Great success, great talent but not great reward to the point that two of them took their own lives. Very, very sad. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that Joey's still out there, though. He's still yes. plugging away, and he's always performing somewhere, and 
still making new music too. Yeah, he is. He's a great guy. So, yeah. I mean, again, that's that was one of the hardest chapters to write in the book because you know you you I you 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 recognize great bands and Badfinger great band, but you almost don't like writing their story because it it it's only got one ending and it's it's not a happy ending. Mm. And there's something to be said about bands where you have many songwriters within the group, mm -hmm. many lead vocalists within the group, and it adds so much overall to the whole experience mm -hmm. of listening to the band. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, those bands are the great minority, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, to have Pete Ham there and Tommy Evans, Joey Mullen and Mike Gibbons, even in the beginning when they were with Ron Griffiths, um, mm -hmm. who wrote Dear Angie, um, a lot of great material with all mm -hmm. those people. And um, very, very sad what happened. It's one of the most tragic yeah. stories ever. It, it is. And I, it, I only had so much space in the book. And, um, yeah. and I, but I did tell the whole story um to, to the point of what happened with the royalties from um you know the, the, the their own music and um and it, it is so sad mm -hmm. that such a, a great band should should be so afflicted really mm. Mm -hmm. okay yeah. let's do one last artist and that's doris troy and there's somebody that had quite a bit of history before she was signed with apple she had a major hit in the u.s with just one look which was also covered by the hollies and they had success with that song but um she was at first a backup singer on atlantic records mm -hmm. for uh, artists like the drifters and um solomon burke and i didn't realize she was also part of a group called the sweet inspirations with mm -hmm. sissy houston and her nieces, Dee Dee and Dionne Warwick. So, um, talk a bit what a about pedigree. what's that? What a pedigree! Yeah, the mm. song "Ain't That Cute," which gets some attention every now and then, was actually written by Doris and George. Mm. But it's interesting that that song was really just made up in the studio. Yeah, that, I think that most probably was a bit of a challenge for George because George. Is a perfectionist, and mm -hmm. um, I remember uh, um, Alex James, uh, George's friend from way back, Quarryman days, school days, said, "You know, Alex, uh, the, George, he liked to get things just right, you know, with his guitar playing, and um, would spend quite a bit of time getting things right." Um, and I think it was the same with his songs. You know, George liked to. He particularly liked to get the lyrics right. Um, and um, Doris, however, would be in the studios and uh, would record a song on the spot from scratch. So Ain't That Cute with typical Doris. She'd uh, take a phrase, everyday phrase, and build a song around it. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what they did together with that song. So that... that uh, um, not, yeah, I would say it was most probably a bit of a learning curve for George. Um, yeah. But uh, it, it, they put that together in the studio at Abbey. Um, at, at, uh, Trident, at, right? Uh, wasn't it Trident? Trident. Yeah, it wasn't Trident at, at Abbey Road. It was tr Trident. And um, George had signed um, Doris because she was working in London at the time as a backing singer. Uh, she'd had a checkered career, but she'd come over and was living in in uh, London and working as a back as a singer with um, the gal that was in um, Blue Blue Mink. Was it Blue? Hmm. I've forgotten the name of the group. But anyway, she was working with her, and um, they'd gone along to do some singing um, at Apple. I think on um, that's how God 
planned it with Billy Preston. They were doing some work with Billy Preston at Apple, okay. and George had seen her, and um, George had met her a few years earlier at Ready Steady Go when Doris was over mm -hmm. promoing a single that she had out at the time called um, uh, "What You Going to Do About It," which is no relation to the Small Faces mm -hmm. song. Um, but anyway, and he told her then, you know, oh, I really like, um, you, you know, your your, your single, um, uh, and um, anyway, she was getting work as a backing singer, and, and then he offered her a work at Apple, not just as a backing singer, but as a writer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, th I think she said to him, you, you know, yes, I'll come and work at Apple, but I'd like to be uh, I'd like a contract as a writer and as a singer. <laughs> so she talked herself into several contracts. And I think mm. that was typical of Doris. Um, and so the next thing, they're making an album. And of course, in those days, the, the, the deal was you make an album, but you have a, a single to be released to to promo the forthcoming album, really. To um, to alert people to your presence, um, to try and get a hit single, but also to uh, to promo the album, and so together they wrote "Ain't That Cute" in the studio, and um, my friend Alan West, uh, Alan White, sorry, Alan White, um, he uh, he said to me, "I played drums on that." Mm. I played on quite a bit of quite a few sessions at Apple at that time because I was um, working with John and the Plastic Ono band and I would sit in sometimes I was also working with George on uh, quite a bit of his material that he was cutting with other artists and I remember sitting on, on that one and other songs on that album and Lars Vorman I think it was also wrote some songs with Doris. Okay. And, uh, Jackie Lomax also wrote some songs with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was quite a, I mean, the, 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 you drop in at those studios and those recording sessions and you'd have some really prestigious names because they're drawn to George, you know, and the other artists who were performing on those records. Yeah. Peter Frampton did the lead guitar solo. Mm -hmm. I ain't that cute, and that was the first time he ever met George. Mm. Apparently, yes, he was so. called over, and I think he thought he was just going to play rhythm, but George, George said, "No, that's the guitar. You, you're doing the lead." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because some people think it's Eric, because Eric was George's big buddy at the time. But it, mm -hmm. it's Peter Frampton playing that lead guitar because Peter Frampton, brilliant guitarist. Okay. And a big name in those days. You know, the face of 68, wasn't it? Something like that. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, well, um, Humble Pie. Humble Pie, yeah. Um, uh, and, um, and uh, yeah, oh, God, what's his, his name? What did he rise to fame on, the, the group he rose to fame on? It wasn't Humble Pie, because that was with Stevie Marriott. Mm -hmm. a competition. But before Humble Hi, um, oh God, what were they called? I forgot, but they <laughs> okay, yeah, they they were quite a band as well. It will come to me as soon as we put the phone down. Yeah, <laughs> all right. Well, for everybody, this is your new book, The Songs the Beatles Gave Away. We managed to get through most of the artists that you covered there. Um, it is a tremendous book. Before you go. Um, you're also um, involved with a project called Prefab. Actually, there's a book. Um, yeah, that title. I am, but just two things. I'm gonna. You mentioned mm -hmm. to me some very old friends of mine who I knew through Alan White, right. who's the drummer with Yes. Sure. Yes. And I'd just like to say how sad it was for me before my book came out to, to learn that Alan had passed away and Alan White introduced me to 
Apple Jam. There you go. I had mentioned that group before. Yep. So, um, yeah. Apple Jam made a, an album here per performing 15 songs composed by the Beatles but never released by the group. Mm -hmm. they, they, they play Seattle or they used to. And I, if they ever listen to this broadcast um I'm, I'm you know i think i wrote to one of the members because they still periodically release music of beatles material i'm yeah. trying to think there was one of um one of the songs that george harrison didn't release at the time you know what and to the, do no no you no know what to do. but that's that's no that's from 1964 i'm talking about um mm -hmm. one of the songs that I believe was, I could be wrong here. I'm just doing this from memory, but there was one of the songs that he didn't release for All Things Must Pass, maybe. All right. Or during the Get Back, Let It Be sessions. One of those one mm -hmm. of those songs they released digitally at the time. And um, I know it's out there. So I, they're still continuing. No, but I will good. try to find out more about the band anyway. And just on that thing, uh, Scylla Black, for all American uh, listeners, uh, Scylla Black was invited by George Harrison uh, to, to record a few of his songs That's right. in the 70s. And um, Scylla said to Bob and I that um, Ringo offered her photograph. You know the song Photograph? Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he offered her photograph, but had second thought. So she never got to record photo. <laughs> <Right. laughs> I think it's a great, great story. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So and so and, she got uh, offered she got offered songs by all four Beatles. Hmm. Ringo. George. There you go. Yeah. Okay. That's, so, that's a rarity that's, right there. Yeah. So how much that's how much they thought of Scylla. Right. Now I remember in George's book, I mean mine, he talked about um the Light That Has Lighted the World originally was written yeah. for Scylla. That's what mm -hmm. George said. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'll Still Love You, which was mm -hmm. a song that was hanging around a lot mm -hmm. before Ringo recorded it, when it was called uh, When Every Song Is Sung. George offered that to several people, Scylla being mm -hmm. one of them, Leon mm -hmm. Russell, and, and Leon and Mary Russell, another one. So yeah, Scylla plays a big part there in Beatle mm -hmm. history. And I think um, I think I tell those stories in my book. I mean, as as you most probably realized, I've forgotten most of what I've written because it just it happens when you get old. <laughs> There's also a lot of information in there. It's hard for the the brain to remember everything. But it is. um, yeah, I, and I just wanted to say, Alan White. I had the chance to interview him. Mm -hmm. Um. And it was an incredible honor. It's one of the most watched videos on my channel here. Right. And yeah. there's a chance, I don't like saying that it's definite. It's either it's either the last interview he ever gave or certainly one of the last. And um, did a lot of talking about his work with, with John and with George in particular. And, uh, you know, incredible honor for me yeah he's a great great guy i love, love alan and his wife gigi and they're always very they were, whenever they were in liverpool we'd always get together and uh, they, when i would go to seattle i used to see see them great great but you were asking me about my other book yes which you've written with colin hanton one of the members of the quarryman the drummer yeah and this is the new edition slightly revised uh, because it's got a, a cover that is the poster for the documentary film that is coming out um, this year. And um, this, uh, this is so exciting for us because we've worked so hard on this. Colin and I both appear in the film. Mm -hmm. I've done so much work on the, on the film itself and um i can't I, i'm not at liberty to say who's in the film but it's 
it, it, there's some really interesting people in this film, uh, as well as the, the Quarrymen, quite a mm -hmm. few interesting people. Um, and you've got to think who was in the Quarrymen. And um, yeah, it's going to come out. And um, I'm, I appeared, should have appeared with Colin Hanton last year at the Florida Film Festival as the opening film. And it was, and I was there, but Colin decided to get COVID the day before, so he couldn't fly. <laughs> Um, which was a real, you know, we were so upset that he didn't um, make that, um, but it went down very well, the film. And um, we're hoping hoping um, it's, it's going to appear at um, a film festival in March in the States, and I will be there promoing the film. Um, you, mean so, and, you mean this um, March? In I a month from now? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I hope. I hope. I can't say too much because the the film has not been announced for the festival. But there's a I've been it, I've, it's been mentioned to me that it might be, and I think they've done that to, for me to make sure I stay alive long enough to be there. Is so this, um, is this the first the first for Beatle fans? No, it's not. It's a proper film festival, you know. For, okay. So it's not not a Beatle fest. Okay. Um, the Florida Film Festival wasn't um, a Beatle thing; it was a film festival. Okay. Um, so it's it's got major distribution, um, or it will get major distribution. Um, so yeah, we're very proud of it because Colin Hanton and I wrote this book for his granddaughter. He said to me, "Colin, will you help me write my book?" And I said, "Yeah, of course I will." You know, um, I charged him a pint. <laughs> that's it <laughs> a pint and look what's happened anyway <laughs> I'm only joking and um, it's been such a joy and an adventure for us but I, I just thought I'd point that out and um, I'll let you know exactly the date it gets the, the commercial release so people can, can watch it please do so this is all about Colin's memories of the Quarrymen days it, it is it, it's his story from birth to the day he left the quarrymen. All right. Okay. And he was with the quarrymen on the day that they met Paul. He was with the quarrymen when George joined. He was with the quarrymen when they recorded in spite of all the danger. And that'll be the day mm -hmm. and, and beyond. So he was there the longest of the original quarrymen. Right. So he plays with George and Paul and John, and he he, he played down the cavern with them. And so it's an interesting book, and I, we had such fun writing it. It was a great pleasure. It was well worth that pint. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So so the book itself is available on Amazon, or you can get you can get both books on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, but both books are published by, well, you can get them on the website of the publisher, www.greatnorthernbooks.co.uk. Okay. And my new book costs 19 pounds 99 pence and if you buy it from the publisher um you can get a signed copy for no extra cost and i think it costs 10 extra pounds to send it to america right okay but if you buy it from amazon you don't get it signed well you definitely want it signed now you do you do you took it. I got a beautiful signature, and this one is not signed. But if you go on the Quarrymen website, mm -hmm. I think Colin has signed it. All right, so I'll be putting all this information up in our description box. Yeah, okay. And, and this has been just delightful, Colin. Having yeah, you here. So, yeah, we we're not. This isn't the bit that's going to be on film, is it? <laughs> no. No. Okay. Well, it's just that I'm sorry if I was a bit hazy. I I I suffered from brain fatigue. You know, my brain um, 
my brain leaks sometimes, you know, and I, even though I wrote the book, I just sometimes I get a bit tired and um, forget some of the stuff that's in there. When you asked me about Mark Lewis and stuff like that, I, 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 Mark's book is in there, but an awful lot of it is just what I've interviewed Paul a couple of times now and, um, and people, other people. So it isn't just Mark Lewis, I have to tell you, because Mark's um, book, Turn, Tune In, yeah. only goes up to a certain point. The end of 62. Yeah, and after that, um, uh, which will for quite a lot of these songs, most of all of these songs, yeah, uh, uh, quite a lot. Of them. Um, that that's my own personal research and interviews. Okay, and it's yeah. definitely a worthwhile read. Everybody watching, I I advise you picking up the book, and hopefully we'll talk to you again very soon, perhaps with Colin Hatton. That'd be very nice. And yeah, I'll definitely get Colin. In. And I got to know your stories about about Mendips <laughs> and, um, you know, your wife is welcome too. anytime she wants to be on camera to talk about Portland Road. So thank you so much for being here, Colin. Thanks to all of you for taking the time to watch this. This is this is, I think, my longest interview ever, <laughs> but well worth it. Yeah, I certainly feel very old now. <laughs> no, it's been great. It has been great. I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, and, and what Frida Kelly said to me was, Colin, I like what you're doing because you are reminding people that there were other bands out there in the 60s from Liverpool in particular, but that the, the, there's always something you can find out about the Beatles that you didn't know. And oh. that's, that's why I wanted to write it because it's so difficult to find a, a new angle to come at the Beatles from. And um, as custodian, people are always saying to me, are you going to write a book about the Beatles? Are you going to write a book about the Beatles? And I thought, mm, why do I need to write a book about the Beatles? And, and I would only do it if I could find something which I thought there isn't a book about this out there. And as far as I could see, there wasn't. And so this gave me my angle, my in to the Beatles. And um, so this is why I chose to write yet another book about the Beatles, because it wasn't one that I felt had been written. Yeah, you know, I've always said, there's no way we're ever going to know everything about the Beatles. And it's, no. it's quite miraculous when people find new angles to write mm. these books. But, um, you know, there's still great books coming out right now as we speak. Yours is one of them. <laughs> and, uh, Colin, this has been, uh, you know, complete joy having you on. Well, thank you very much, Ken. All power to you and uh, lots of love to everybody. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you for watching. We'll see you again real soon. Take care.